She looks harder. I'm not going to describe what she sees. First of all, that would be spoiling it. Unless you already know, in which case, I guess what's taking place here qualifies as something closer to dramatic irony. But if you really want to see it for yourself, stop what you're doing, flip the whole thing over, and begin again. I'll be right here when you get back, waiting. Trust me, no one's going anywhere. So, what do you think? It's difficult to say. I suppose there are negatives and positives. I can't say if that option would be any better or worse than what we're experiencing now. Whichever way our fate unravels, there's too much of something. Too much blood, too much sugar. I almost can't see through it. It's as if our extra canon reality, our surroundings, our actions and their consequences, they've all lost the ability to blend the ingredients responsibly. You know what I mean? Yes. As if the moment we entered the victory state, everything began to slowly congeal, and when John made his decision, it accelerated the process. The congealing intensified, causing a sort of grotesque conceptual clumping, concentrating the constituent properties of consumption into unbearable doses, like when you get to the bottom of a sweet drink and all that's left is syrup. It's glowing dark. It's growing dark around her again. The apparition she's been projecting behind her fades and she starts to bleed light and shadow in all directions. Her physical eyes are open now, and shining bright. It's a striking sight. She's beautiful, actually. Diaphanous and disheveled, with, filled with, and filled with the limitless light of metaspiritual curiosity. But for all the effervescent mysticism of her otherworldly becoming, I feel like this is the very first time I'm truly seeing her for what she's always been to me. She's my daughter in every sense of the word. My equal. My mirror. It used to be odd to consider it, a technical fact that I accepted as a genetic reality, but nothing that could ever quite penetrate down to the soul. But in this moment, it doesn't feel strange at all. It feels right, suddenly. And I know she must feel the same way. There's no way she doesn't. All she needs is a nudge in the right direction. We're family, and we belong together. After years of micromanaging the inconsistent and confused desires of total imbeciles, wouldn't it be a relief to have someone by my side who understood me? You're almost there. All your eyes are open, Rose. Now all you need to do is take a step off the precipice. It'll be a long fall, but I'll catch you. What if the person you catch isn't me anymore? Who gives a fuck? She'll be better. And there, right there, is the moment she lets go. She uncouples herself from the creaking, buckling partitions of her physical mind, and her consciousness dissolves into a space more vast, a domain given structure and order by my words and conviction. She's permitted the barriers between us to fall, to allow us to know each other more perfectly. As she was saying before, to resist this, to question it in any way, would be to succumb to dysfunction, to pathological insularity, to sociological sin. Would it not to be real that or would it not be to renounce humanity itself? And yet, ironically, renouncing hum our humanity is exactly what we have just arguably done. Good riddance, I say. Her body should be dead now, but I'm holding it together until I can implement the more permanent solution I have in mind. All in due time. For now, what is there but to savor this moment? To appreciate her final waking minutes as a being of flesh and blood? She turns, and the lights from her eyes is blinding. It dims a bit as she lowers her eyelids. She regards me with an almost unbearably bright adoration, the kind that's difficult to look at directly, but you can't manage to look away either. It's the first time, it's like the first time you see the green sun. Of course it is, because that's the way I'm describing it. The truth belongs to me, and as of now, so does she. I see it now. You're right. Have I ever not been? You... A wrinkle in her brow. It smooths out quickly. She murmurs to herself, trailing off quietly. What time is it? I step forward and steady her, hand firm but gentle against her cheek. That's all she needs, a stable anchor. Rose, does time even exist? You already know the answer. So anyways, uh, I'm here, hi, and I'm still doing this. It's past midnight now. Maybe I should put my socks back on and put this coat on. I'm kind of cold, man. I was kind of shivering while I was reading that. Shit. Ugh. Socks. Socks, socks, socks.
what are you saying? Yeah. Good. Oh, this is good. Jade kicks her sole shoeless feet behind her slowly, as if she's swimming with the current of the gravitational waves pulling her ever closer to their source. Her feet aren't completely bare, they're still covered by her dra gray st striped witch so stockings, but the ruby slippers are gone. She kicked them off hours ago, as if to jettison all hope of returning anywhere resembling a place she used to call home. The fond remembrance of such a plane no longer has any pull on her. Now, something enti else entirely is pulling on her. Believe me, I'm sympathetic to the temptation. It's always just there, isn't it? A limitless reservoir of emptiness, perfectly available to you. Patient, omnipresent, and dead ahead. As someone who grew up in the middle of an ocean, completely alone, on a planet purged of all human life 400 years before I was born, I understand the feeling as well. But something isn't right here. She should really reconsider whatever it is she may be about to do. There's something about being alone for so long. It makes time feel like it doesn't exist. She knows this almost better than I do. Jade knows well enough by now that time doesn't actually exist in a literal sense the way we generally understand it. It's just one aspect of many and the complement of her own space. Therefore, it can be neutralized by the introduction of her essence, reduced to white noise or soft light. The continuum of time is therefore demonstrably an illusion. The field of sequential moments and physical conditions that stretch on and on, resulting in the mirage of loneliness, is pure projection from disproportionate attention given to a single side of a cosmic polar pair of ideas, time. It's my way of saying, and thereby alerting her to mind what she already knows, that this feeling of all-consuming solitude and despair haunting her since childhood, it's in her head. The ticking of time is a little contrivance in her mind, as a byproduct of imbalance, of the vast disparity between her limited self and her ultimate self. It lives rent-free the way Dave once did, and for this version of da Jade, probably still does. He made fun of her sometimes when they were kids, because she couldn't always keep real and fake things straight. But he never meant it seriously. It was just the way he showed he cared, which is one of the things Jade always liked so much about him, that he's clumsy and genuine under it all. Maybe Dave broke her heart a little, and keeps doing it too, no matter how many different timelines they try out. She slips closer into the event horizon, still making no effort to impede her descent. My persuasion skills are admittedly a little rusty. Bear with me here. In my experience, there's something about being alone that can take a person's limited meat engine and make it imagine that it can see beyond the confines of its own electrical processes, make it believe that it's ascending to a place where it can see the four dimensions spread out like a set of windows, like sheet music. Like a garden where Jade used to spend so much of her time with her hands in the earth and her head in the clouds, dreaming about flowers that bloomed in six colors when grew and she played them a song. Was that real? It's hard to tell. But it made her happy, didn't it? Isn't that what she needs now? Isn't it reasonable to presume that that's the only thing capable of persuading her to slow her descent? To be invited to imagine, fake or otherwise, that which once made her happy? That which could still make her happy if only she'd slow down, think about it, and do whatever is necessary to place herself in those surroundings again. It's possible that manning the other end of a suicide hotline transmitted through pure thought in a metatextual format may not actually be my true calling. God damn it, I have to change between the narrator voice I want to do most of the time and the dirt voice, like, pretty often whenever I catch some fourth wall first person shit in a paragraph. And then I hold on to it for, like, the entire paragraph, even though not all of it is essentially Dirk breaking the fourth wall. I'm doing my goddamn best here. She isn't. She just isn't slowing down for some incomprehensible reason. Perhaps my touch is too soft. It wouldn't be the first time. 
perhaps the limits of persuasion itself are being tested by the most powerful gravitational force to ever exist. Or perhaps it's true that insistence is just the most effective, perhaps, of persuasion. So I'm insisting now. Jade Harley will not go into that hole. She does not want to see what happens when she unsettles the spirit residing there. She does, though. Fucking yikes. Jade throws on the brakes. I say she does, but by now the gravity's overwhelming. Is she even trying to resist, or is it just that it's useless to try? I'm... I'm not sure I can tell. Jade realizes, preferably before it's too late, that this is fucking serious. She needs to turn around. She doesn't want this. She doesn't want to die. She wants to return to me. All right, I'm done messing around. Your name is Jade Harley. You decide right now that you do not want to die. You resist the pull of the black hole with all your might. What would killing yourself accomplish? Sure, most of your friends are dead, but John is still looking for you. Do you want to let him down? Do you want to crush his soul? Do you have any appreciation for what he's going through, Jade? He can take you home, to your new home, Earth C, the one I made for you, Jade. Your friends are all there, alive and well. Rose, Cartcat, Dave, Slutty Adult Jade, Jane, Jake, Roxy, me. You wouldn't want to disappoint them. You wouldn't want to disappoint me, would you, Jade? You can avoid all this. The un un predictable consequence is about to be unleashed by your thoughtless act. You can tur still turn this thing around. It's not too late. But it is too late. Christ, you're close now, to the ceiling of cancerous deformity. Too close, just skimming this edge of this thing's vicious horizon. You dip your toes through the place where the singularity is snapping everything apart at the seams. It's so loud that it's completely silent. You seal yourself stretched thin, distorted, pulled out with your descent elongated for all eternity. When you look down, the stripes of your witchy tights go on and on for miles. Please, Jade, don't ever say I didn't try to stop this. She closes her eyes and lets go. And then she opens her eyes. Not the jade who returned to me, the jade living on Earth Sea, sleeping on a couch. So is this what we're doing now? She snaps awake. Her human hands are clammy. Her face, expressive due to the layers of flesh enveloping her skull, appears haunted to her friends. Oh my god! Jade! Jade, are you okay? Callie, hurry, she's waking up. J John? Rose? Is Dave... What, what happened to... Yo, it's okay. Dave's cool. Rose is cool. Everyone's just straight chilling like usual. I see how it is. You don't even intend to acknowledge me. Real fucking mature. If you're going to force the issue of this little meta-narrative tug-of-war between us, the least you could do is establish a clear adversarial dichotomy between our opposing goals. Jade stares straight ahead, feeling the weight of Roxy's arms around her shoulders. She derives no warmth from the interaction. Her mind is being flooded by the memories of her deceased splinter self, the chaos of battle, the excruciating impalement, the feeling of floating alone through the void. A chill spreads through her body. She will never be the same again. Actually, you know what? I think Jade's, Jade's doing just fine. She's wobbly when she gets up off the couch, sure, a little mesophysically stunned, but pretty used to the sensation of having a doomed self fold into the extra space in her gray matter. You know, considering it's already happened before, Remember Jade Sprite? People always forget about Jade Sprite. So maybe we could stand to dial down the melodrama just a bit. When Jade turns to look at Roxy, her eyes are completely bat black. Whoa, what the actual fu- Are you- Are you in there, Jade? Jade does not answer. The dead cherub scares her surroundings, expression neutral. For the sake of clarity, the dead cherub is a phrase I'm using in reference to myself. Presently, I inhabit Jade's body, and though her- through her I may influence this world. I'm enabled to convey events which take place here, and therefore con confine the procession of causality to exist within a secure textual flame framework. My presence shall mitigate, if not altogether subdue, the corrosive effect on reality and the will of its occupants by those who would manipulate the way of events, telegraph for their own megalomaniacal objectives. Okay, now you're just being passive-aggressive. Despite his pretensions to a greater design, the Prince of Heart cannot be allowed to continue to exert unchecked control over the authoritative re recitation of events on this side of my horizon. It cannot be overstated the extent to which he represents a threat to the continued existence of both this world and corporeal life itself. Damn, you better watch those hot takes. You might, slightly, you might mildly scald someone with observations this fresh. The prince uselessly squirms and wails in protest at his imminent narrative impotence. However, there is nothing he can do 
so long as Jade remains in this trance. Nah, I'm being chill as a cucumber about this. Considering you're vague blocking the shit out of my metho methodological, methodological approach to storytelling right where I can see it. Which is to say, directly into my fucking brain, apparently. Calliope emerges from the kitchen, carrying a bowl of cold water and a cloth. Jane, Jade turns to her head to meet the sound of their footsteps. I came back as fast as I could. I came as fast as I could. The bowl of water clatters to the floor. Calliope does not have human flesh and thus cannot go pale. What drains from them is not color, but the comforting certainty of their very existence. They can sense the presence of their other self in Jade's body. Their timeline, fruitful, full of life and friends, sparks against mine. Desolate, endless, sparking with righteousness and resolve. Our divergent arcs collide in the pr primacy of their subconscious, bringing to the forefront of their mind the bleak fate they avoided by narrative fiat alone. Calliope's distress is obvious. Roxy slides off the couch to approach them, but Calliope stumbles backward in terror and trips in their desperation to escape. Roxy gapes at them. Hey, Callie, what's going on? I... Calliope, it's okay, just talk to me. Calliope does not talk to them. Roxy looks to Calliope, then to Jade, sensing that there is dark energy coursing between them. Would one of you just effing say something already? Finally, Calliope lets out a shriek and flees the apartment. Roxy appears as if they intend to run after them, but finds himself drawn back to Jade. They return to the couch as an unnerved look begins to disturb their features. Jade says nothing. She gives no ind indication that I inhabit her body, aside from the unusual appearance of her eyes. Anchoring myself here in this host is enough to serve my purpose. There is no need to operate this body beyond keeping it in reserve as a silent yet alert vessel for my cognizance. There are other priorities I must attend to, cosmologically. This work is very important. The prince must be kept at bay. The work? Getting some pretty self-important vibes here. Like maybe someone needs to get over herself? I was just having a little fun. Ever fucking hear of that, dead skull girl? Didn't think so. This all feels really heavy-handed suddenly. Like you're making a federal fucking issue out of what should be some light entertaining stuff. Just a bunch of loser adults trying to be the people they grew up to be in the best ways they know how. But no, I guess you know best. Being an impossibly ancient alien recluse with no virtually no exposure to human culture, emotion, or values. Yeah, go ahead. Just take over. Sounds fine. The prince finds that his hold on the narratives slipping through his hands. There's an old myth in Earth culture about katanas, that if you keep the blade wedded to a mirror sheen, it can cut a silk scarf, falling through the air cleanly in two. His hold over our perceptions shall be severed just as elegantly. Yo, I get you're attempting to spin a metaphor both relevant and specific to my self-made symbology here, and I appreciate the effort, I really do, but I just cannot stand by and let you shamelessly spread such irresponsible information on a subject so near and dear to my heart. The katana is a cutting weapon. Inert, it's harmless. Deceptively so, you might even say. Dangerous things appear banal and inert. That's just basic physics. It's actually the motion of the katana that may- Roxy sets the cool cloth on Jade, Jade's forehead and frowns. They're worried and confused, but determined to care for their friend. Hey, I'm in the middle of turning your apocryphal metaphor into something substantive without allegorical weight here. I'd appreciate it if you would- in his haste to manipulate the events surrounding Doom Jade's ascent toward an outcome favorable to himself, the prince has unwittingly revealed several glaring weaknesses. By dictating the reality of others through expressions which he and he alone can relate to, he resorts to comparing all experience to his own, presuming his status on his side of this side of my horizon would forever go unchallenged. His hubris went unchecked. He exposed too much of himself to all who would observe his wanton display of self-gratification. Many of his personal biases and experiences have leaked through the seams of textual causality, leaving them vulnerable to exploitation by an adversary. Experiences such as the sensation of presiding over a vast, empty ocean, his ocean, which terminates with a horizon. It is a barrier, not real, but physiological, psychological, symbolic. No matter how much power he achieves as a man, he knows there are horizons he perceived as a boy which he may never cross. And yet I have crossed mine, with the express purpose of perpetually and eternally reminding him of his limits and enforcing them. Limits which, like his vast empty ocean, serve to remind him that he is ph phenomenologically, if not literally, alone. That he has experienced loneliness intimately and absolutely, just like I have. But unlike me, he is terrified by it. 
And I, unlike him, understand all too well that the children left alone are those who most despair at being ignored. Fuck you. I fucking hate you. You're fucking boring. Your narrative voice is a total fucking drag. And someday, I'm gonna make you pay for this. There. Can you hear it? Of course you can't. But if even you could, it would sound like nothing at all. Do I get to stop doing uh, multiple voices now? Great. I can use a normal narrator voice. Ah! Dude, like, I can't process what's going on in my stomach. Like, for the last hour, I have my, it hasn't hurt. But I've had somewhat of a stitch in my side from talking so much. Or I could be hungry. I don't think I'm hungry. No, this is actual just dull pain. This epilogue is actually hurting me. Ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Holy shit, man. If I do this to my stomach, does it make it better? I'm just sort of pounding on it. Which makes some other sensation in my stomach that sort of distracts from the fact that it might be in dull pain. Am I fine now? I might be fine now. Whew. Maybe I'll stand up and take the coat off. Maybe it's my posture or something. Last time changing my posture fixed it. I would do like Mongolian throat singing or something. I have risen. Release any tension held in your body. Drink some water, pussy. All right. Do you ever check your messages and it says one message, but then you check your messages again and it's 47 messages? Um, So one of the messages I received is Neil saying, I have hair in the place that matters, my asshole. And then Wyatt saying, for now. And then Neil saying, what with three exclamation points, what does that mean? My friends are fucking stupid. <sighs> okay, we're back to it, I think. Uh, how long have you been watching? Long enough to smell you flailing about like a wiggler while talking to Jade's shoes. Oh, <laughs> awkward. She stares at John for some time, a curious expression on her face. She says nothing for long enough that John begins to wonder if she has any use for him at all. 
Will she offer one last barbed jest just before Jan vanishing from his life again for good this time? He hopes he means more to her than that. <sighs> I'm yawning, dude. Especially after all the trying experiences they've shared. And he does mean more to her than that. Her hesitation isn't meant to make him feel unwelcome. She's simply processing what she is seeing. Something is off about him. John, do not take this personally, although I do absolutely mean it personally, but you smell like shit. It isn't his unseemly appearance she finds surprising. He's gravely wounded, but it's not that either. Something else is different about him, different somehow, from how he, she thought he'd be when she imagined they'd meet next. Under all the gore, he smells too fresh. She decides to keep her observations to herself, lest she cause this ailing version of John more confusion. Yeah, well, you smell like shit too. I assume that you're correct, being that I've been out here for a certain amount of time with limited access to food and water, but I think that your situation is a bit more serious than mine, as you seem to be bleeding to death from a tooth in your chest. John laughs, exposing his two rows of alarmingly dull human teeth and signature characteristics of his smile. Oh, this? It's only a flesh wound. <laughs> yes, John. Generally, wounds happen to, tend to happen to the flesh. No, see, it's a movie reference. There's this knight and he keeps losing the fight he's in, but he refuses to give up. So when they cut off his arms and legs and stuff, he keeps acting like it's no big deal. And to remain defiant, he keeps saying stuff like, It's only a flesh wound. <laughs> Is that the title of the movie? No, the movie's called Monty Python. It actually kind of sucks. Movies from the 90s are so much better. I don't know why I'm quoting this crap. I must really be in bad shape here. Terezi tips her head to one side, with what John personally regards as a cute expression, one she, he believes is unique to her. Whether he's correct or not, it's his belief that there's no one else who emotes in this banner. It's both quizzical and mocking, two descriptors that he considers to be an apt summation of her personality as well. John pauses, reflecting on the word cute as it passes through his mind. He wonders if this is what he really thinks of Trezzy, without influence, without delirium, without mistaking one emotion for another. But it is what he thinks of her, quite truthfully. I have no desire to interject thoughts into others' minds or to sway intent, nor do I see value in masking the reality of the emotions that I transcribe. This is how he feels. His mind, however, has made a habit of being less clear about his thoughts than I am willing to be. John would be mortified with human embarrassment if he could understand the clarity and precision with which I am willing to telegraph his thoughts, but his embarrassment is irrelevant to me. As always, the truth is paramount. John thinks Terezi is very cute. He always has. He, sh he thinks she's small for how big she talks, and has a nose that resembles a button. These qualities he regards as particularly adorable, due to their sharp contrast with her harsh and incisive demeanor. John recalls the concept of gap moe, a term which the prince, speaking from his self-aggrandized position as a scholar of ancient earth Asian earth lore, once explained to mean a charming, measured discrepancy between one's archetypical appearance and idiosyncratic personal attributes. Terezi is definitely cute, John decides. The conclusion is now at the forefront of his mind. I don't fucking believe this. But still he resists, doubts himself. Perhaps it's even weirder to frame it this way, he wonders. He fears he's in danger of seeming like the type of creepy human male who's likely to collect large pillows bearing the illustrated images of Japanese Earth females. To me, this idea means nothing, but it is causing him to sweat. He is worried that these are the thoughts entertained by a man of low character, by perhaps a scoundrel. His worries are interrupted as Trezzy floats over and licks him on the forehead. Don't strain yourself thinking too hard there, Egbert. Uh, yeah, now that I think about it, that was a dumb metaphor. It's one of those earth things that's particularly impossible for an alien to understand. Maybe it's the blood loss. Ugh, I'm probably making a fool of myself here. John, your monkey python anecdote was vintage Egbert tier Adora stupid. Don't worry about it. Besides, on Alternia it would be considered weird for someone to stop a fight just for losing a limb. Really? Yeah, if someone in the military ran away just for that, they'd probably get called. Wow, Alternia sucked. Yeah. Suddenly, Terezi sways, feeling woozy. John reaches out to catch her shoulders, steadies her. Now, closer, he examines her face in detail. Detail, that's a word that people say like that. Her complexion is chalky. Compared to humans, trolls have litter, little color to lose. When they feel 
if you feel ill, there's a pallor to them, a dusty quality running deeper than the surface of the skin. Whoa, are you okay? Of course not. John, I'm in the process of starving to death. Didn't I just say I've been out here for a long time? All right, I'm just worried about you, dumbass. Don't need to jump out my throat for every little thing. I'm sorry. Just, how long have you been out here, Trezzy? I have no idea. Time passes differently here, not always in a straight line. Sometimes it feels like I've been here a hundred sweeps. I'm not even sure. That's not true. It's hard to stay anchored. Ooh, that's pretty heavy. Yeah. Here, look. I found my dad's wallet floating out there, like, fucking randomly. Can you believe that? Let's see if there's any food on it. She hesitates, weigh weighing her temptation to playfully antagonize John against the virtue of sincere expression. There are times she worries the latter may be more appropriate. Thanks, Egbert. No problem. We're friends, Terezi. It's not like I'm going to let you die out here because we bicker sometimes. You don't have to be so on guard. Actually, I'm glad to see you. I've been thinking about you a lot lately. I... When John opens the wallet, the first thing he sees stored in the capacious modus is a spare car. His ever-prepared father must have kept along a second one as a backup. Perhaps, as John speculates, in case his primary vehicle got a flat tire. You what, John? Hold that thought. Check this out! John deploys the spare car. It looks brand new, like the day his father brought one, of, one from, back from the dealership. It strikes John as the first bit of good luck he's had all day. Terezi is less impressed. This is, is this pathetically primitive four-wheel device edible, or am I misunderstanding something here? No, it's just that I... John's vision is dark and blurry around the edges. He's reminded he's not in perfect physical condition either, and could use a moment of rest. He climbs onto the trunk of the car, assuming a sitting position with his legs dangling in front of the bumper. He exhales, then turns to look at Terezi. He pats the place beside him, inviting her to sit. She looks skeptical, but relents, shimmying up next to him on the chrome. She shugs out of the straps of her rocket pack. They sit silently for several minutes, shoulders two inches apart. The atmosphere is thin and chilly. Below their dangling feet, the black hole looms, watching them. Above, the sky seems to stretch on more than infinitely. More infinitely than a typical infinite expanse, without being boxed in by the pr properties of space or time. John observes Terezi watching the sky. The light flickers, meteoric, over her sharp features. He casts pools of shadows beneath her eyes and the dip of her neck. Her innocent, his innocent thoughts continue, with the cautious yet growing confidence of a skittish animal creeping out of the woods. It's confident only in its surety of being unobserved. Like, like this, he does not think she is. Like this, she does not think she is cute at all. No, she's beautiful. This vision of her is haunting to him. It's really a mess out here, isn't it? Yeah. He opens the wallet again, both to search for something edible and to take his eyes away from her. Objects begin appearing around him as he leaps through the cards. A crumpled fedora, a silk tie, his father's backup cufflinks. What are you doing out here, anyway? What do you think I'm doing out here? Looking for Vriska, of course. Still? What do you mean, still? It's, well, it's been years. At least from my perspective, it has. What have you seen since you started looking there's just nothing out here not anymore if you haven't found her yet i hate to say it but she's probably not here i mean she went to fight lord english right i was just there and i didn't see her and i'm pretty sure everyone who was there is dead now i i wouldn't be surprised if we're the only two people left alive out here Terezi stares at him with her wide red eyes years yes oh a year's about half a switch I know that, fool. Oh. It's just sinking in how time has passed differently for us. Right. Time not in the literal sense of seconds passing by, but progress. You've changed so much, and all I've done is waste my entire lifespan walking in circles. Hey, let's not just throw in the towel just yet. Uh, so do you think... Do I actually look that much different to you? She leans in close to sniff him carefully. Hmm. You smell older, but not as old as I thought you'd be. What does that mean? Don't worry about it. Oh, what is that? Terezi appears delighted. She quickly snatches something out of the open wallet. It is a can of human shaving cream. She clutches it with covetous desperation, her mouth watering. Terezi, no! That's not food! John is too late. She sprays the, air sprays the airy white foam directly into her mouth. She's slurping the earth product known as Barbasol greedily, 
groaning in pleasure as it runs down her chin in viscid, frothy rivers. John's eyes bulge at the unappetizing spectacle. He watches with a strange mixture of disgust and fondness. He briefly wonders about the caloric value of the foam. However, regardless of its nutritional merit, it does appear to have restored some vigor, so he decides not to interfere. He feels a tra twinge of pain in his chest, and considers it may be on account of missing her so greatly. But no, it's just my brother's tooth, lodged deep in his chest, spurting its poison. It really should be extracted before it's too late. Uh, you feel better? Yes. That's good, but personally speaking, I feel like total shit. I think we should go back. Home, I mean. N no. She grabs him by the shirt. Her voice begins to waver. He notices desperation in the dark circles under her eyes. Please, John, can we just stay a little longer? His mind knows he must say no. His sense of self-preservation insists on it, but he simply can't. He redoubles his effort to ignore the pain. He fights back tears. She can sense his great struggle, but says nothing. With a tilt of his head, he gestures toward the car. Uh, okay. We can stay a little longer. Why don't you rest in the back seat so you can save your energy? I'll drive. Uh, not like literally drive, but you know. Terezi crawls in the back while John floats into the driver's seat. He summons a gust of wind no to propel the car through the decaying medium, as he once did on the battlefield so long ago. Terezi closes her eyes the moment that her head hits the seat. She snores heavily. John makes a concerted effort not to be creepy about it, but by his own estimation of the word's meaning, yet can, yet cannot stop looking at her in the rearview mirror. He tells himself it's just to make sure she's still breathing, that it's just to make sure she's actually there. To quote Wyatt, I didn't care about ships until the epilogue. Man, my mouth really needs that water, sir. It's like I've been here for years. I haven't had anything to eat or drink. I've just been searching for the end of the epilogue. These pretzels are making me thirsty. Yes, that's right. I have pretzels this time. That is, if you haven't watched um, Candy 3 yet, where I get the fucking pretzels in the middle of the thing. Unified food right now. It's not different. It's the same food. Pretzels are some crunchy shit, I'm sorry. And for the record, we're going to 35. Um, the rest of the parts are still 10. Need, I think, is a total of 44 pages, so it works out. Everybody do the wacky way the inflatable Nathan Barnett. Uh, I got a little water on myself. All right. Man, I really need to, do need to like brush my teeth or something, because the pretzels really get on your molars. Uh, by the way, my chest is feeling all right. I think I'm good. It's just something that happens from time to time. I don't know. 
The elevator to Jane's office opens, and she stumbles inside. The last traces of trickster mode are bleeding off her aura. The great gift of this sacred boon has run its course for the evening, and though she's not as grateful as she should be, she nevertheless acknowledges the extraordinary benefit it has afforded her with a slight nod to the mirror. She pulls a hand through her hair, watching in the reflection as the last of the pink coloration fades to black. She's been campaigning this way for some time now. In fact, it's been over a week since she was last seen in public without the aura bestowed to her by the divine lollipop Juju. There are many benefits to trickster mode, in that it imbues one with an endless supply of enthusiasm and supernatural positivity. Additionally, it prevents one from dwelling on any given personal problems or greater implications of any political statements one might make. However, while a great portion of the electorate adores Jane's elevated sense of charisma and presence while she's in trickster mode, as they should, there are just as many detractors who claim the whole thing is extremely problematic. I doubt this is true, but must also acknowledge it exceeds the scope of my expertise to comment on the subject. Oh my goodness, it's not problematic! In what sense? Dude, if this references the peachy controversy, I'm gonna... Wild. Jane erupts, alone in the elevator, seemingly talking to herself. She appears to be responding to her own inner monologue, which I, admittedly, am presently conducting. She appears to agree with me on this matter. The juju has truly blessed her with great wisdom. I've been during this argument for years, and I honestly cannot see a single thing about it that could even be thinly construed as problematic. Furthermore, despite the fact that I emphatically do not find it to be problematic, I have in the past politely refrained from indulging in the profane pleasures of the trickster lollipop out of respect for those who do find offense with it. However, citizens of the human kingdom delight in my tricksy antics, and what kind of politician would I be if I were to deny my core voting demographic that sort of red meat? candy, I suppose, to imply that I am superliciously, superciliously and recklessly stoking potentially dangerous cultural fires is honestly an insult. I am guilty of only one crime, energizing my base. She's saying it better than I could possibly say it myself. It is unusually gratifying to witness a human with such high regard for hollowed cultural artifacts and the unparalleled blessings they bestow upon lesser beings. Wait, who am I talking to? Jane rubs her eyes under her glasses and groans. Trickster mode is also quite exhausting. What a strange quirk of human biology that excess euphoria must necessarily be followed by crippling despair. She carelessly tosses the lollipop on the floor, lurches toward her desk. No. She turns around promptly, her body jolted by the surprise of her sudden reversal. She bends over, cradles the lollipop reverentially, and situates it carefully in a place signifying respect, atop the mantle after clearing space for it by showing several brittle, worthless objects to the floor. Only then does she drag herself to the desk, her legs shaking as if she had just run a great distance. The moment she sits, sits down, her phone begins to ring. Yes? Yo, know, don't spend too much time in trickster mode. Is that all you have to say? In general? Not by a long shot. But pertaining to this specific issue, yeah, because you should know better. At this rate, you are going to burn yourself out before we even go to the balance. Can you just trust me on this for once? I'm a bit too preoccupied at this exact moment to turn my chair backward and rap at you about the dangers of dough. I know what I'm doing, Dirk. Do I need to remind you that all of this was initially my idea? In that case, how about we tap into some of that outrageous political acumen of yours, dial back the manic pixie dream candidate bullshit, and focus a little more on substantive policy, sp policy speeches? Oh, come on, Dirk. Both you and I know that isn't how politics works. Yeah, you're right. I can't believe I actually said that with a straight face. You say everything with a straight face. Another fair point. See, Jane, this is why you're going to clean this fucking clock in the debates. All I'm saying is, there are better ways to go about unscrupulously manipulating the electorate than burning through your entire lifetime supply of dopamine. Like, perhaps gaming, gaining the ever-vaunted endorsement of Jake English? Exactly. You know, the last time we spoke about this issue, I could have sworn you'd asked me to let you handle Jake. Hmm, I guess I did say that. Dirk, are you doing quite okay? It's very unlike you to forget details like that. I'm fine, Jane. The prince is not fine. He's usually, he's not the type who takes well to having his plans upended, or his control of a shared vehicle fully suppressed. My brother wasn't much that type either. 
Oh, fuck off. I'm nothing like that guy. Huh? What guy? Uh, forget it. I was talking to someone else. Who? Is someone else there with you? I... No, it's nobody. Let's just drop it, okay? Yet unfortunately for everyone in the corporeal realm, the prince isn't the type to overlook the need for backup plans either. He devises contingencies for both success and failure, wheels within wheels, as he likes to imagine. In his workshop, the prince machinates, while the seer both diminishes and ascends. He's being careful to make sure the precise nature of his activity is obscure. He closes his mind to all observation. He scatters many stray parts across his work table and busy busies himself with a variety of misleading and mechanical misleading mechanical tasks to hide the true intent of his schemes from me. But certain objects and actions strike me as more notable than others. That very long red rifle on the table, for instance, a weapon that does not belong to him and has not been used in a very long time. He's been returning to the rifle between his other menial activities of probable misdirection. He dismantles it, reassembles it, slides it off the receiver to examine the firing mechanism. The prince clearly believes he's a very clever boy. My brother did too. Christ. So, on the Jake issue, unfortunately, my influence is a little limited at the moment. What does that mean? A whole lot of bullshit I don't have time to explain, or patience to explain right now. All you need to know is I'm working on a solution, to both my problem and yours. Until then, you should figure out how to get Jake to, at the very least, avoid taking his side. Snapchats. Who the fuck... Actually, I have been thinking. Perhaps this attempt to get Jake on our side is the wrong angle from which to approach this vexing problem. Wouldn't it be much easier to discredit or blackmail him? He's much beloved in the Troll Kingdom for his carefully cultivated posterior, true, but we both know that his bottom is not the only intimate attribute for which he's famed amongst trollish citizens. It would take almost nothing to expose his many dalliances through the human media. Who boy. I know, not to be judgmental, but his zipper is as loose as his pants are tight. That's not what I meant by who boy. You don't think it would work? Oh, it could work. A certain illusion of boyish innocence is an important part of his brand. You contrast that innocence with the with the gyrating of his sinewy thighs, beaming raw sweaty sexuality to the camera alive on TV five nights a week. That's what makes Jake's Eng Jake English work as a marketable commodity. The tension between the two, the inherent friction there. He's got to look coy as hell. Coy as all get out. He is, like, he has no idea how sexy he is. Like, if you actually got him into bed, he'd completely disintegrate into a blushing mess of hesitation and sexless uncertainty. Wow, I've never heard anything more preposterous in my life. Yeah, well, his fans get off on it. So what's the problem? That part of your plan involves exposing his promiscuity with trolls in order to hurt his chances with the human vote. And thereby framing his in interspecies sex as an inherently scandalous thing. I don't know, Jane. That sounds pretty fucking xenophobic. Ah, uh, not again. What isn't xenophobic? Well, for one thing, what you just said there, probably also xenophobic. What? Sorry, that's just how it is. You either gotta roll with the whole woke shit, or decide to commit laborious, symbolic, melodramatic suicide in the process of utterly giving up. Wh yes, it is confusing, but that's why you're lucky to have me as your top advisor and strategist. The prince appears to have discarded the pretense of misdirection at his work table and is focused solely on the red rifle. He clicks the casing back into place. He sets the weapon on his shoulder so he can test the view through the scope. Setting sun bounces off the slick red metal and slices a bar of light across the wall behind him. Sigh. Dirk, do you want me to deal with Jake or not? You've offered nothing but help, help, nothing helpful yet, but you've shot down all my ideas. That's because lately, all your ideas have been fucking terrible, Jane. Seriously, you've got to quit the trickster pop. It's rotting your brain. Said the heathen, the cur, a true philistine. Jane's head swivels sharply to look at the juju on the mantle. She admires it longingly, piously. She will never relinquish her priceless boon, no matter what reprehensible lies the prince whispers into her ear. Then what do you want me to do? Play defense for a while. Like I said, I've got some cakes in the oven, so to speak. But we can't set them on the cooling plate just yet, so go make some fondant in the meantime. Jake frowns. 
Jane frowns. The baking metaphor felt like one contrived purely for her benefit and therefore condescending, and yet she hates how effective it was. She laments her own weakness for being so easily swayed by a well-delivered baking comparison. She lets the prince go and begins making her own plans. In his workshop, the prince lines up an imaginary shot. He pulls the trigger, listening to the pieces within slide and click to within slide and click together in a satisfying concert of metallic sounds. Impeccably assembled, perfectly greased. The gun is not no loaded, but the shot goes off without a hitch. What do you think you're up to, Prince? Your ass is mine, Jake English. He speaks under his breath inaudibly, perhaps frustrated, unaccustomed to scheming while others look over his shoulder. It's perhaps he's not as bold or as confident in his own designs as I believed. I fucking said, your ass is mine, Jake English. Ah, chaps, don't you love to take a rigorous jaunt about the wilds the first thing in the morning, in the middle of the day, and at last thing in the evening? No. Carcant looks, both looks and feels uncomfortable in his red and gray suit. He's tired from an afternoon of campaigning in the consort kingdom. Jake is jaunting rigorously, as he put it, up the ridge of the mountain beside his mansion. Every now and then he pauses to accommodate the pace of his less limber feel, friend, less limber friends. By Jove, Carcat, you're so winded by such a little activity. You've been... It's truly alarming. We've been hiking for a fucking hour, dipshit. I can already feel my legs starting to lock up. I think they're getting a head start on the rigor mortis. Because you're fucking killing me, is what I'm saying, by making me hike through nature in a fucking suit. Great work, everyone. You're the, you'll be offering up a pre-assassinated president to frenzied electorate. Awesome strategy. Perhaps you need a little... Better calisthenics routine. Can I suggest tr several alterations to your morning workout and even give you a lesson or two myself? My morning workout? I couldn't think of a more offensively presumptuous phrase if I tried. Also, what the fuck is a calisthenic? Is that a name of your fan cherub? Carcat's tirade is interrupted as he trips over a protruding tree root. Dave, who has been cheating on their hike by hovering sli very slightly off the ground rather than walking, catches Carcat before his face hits the dirt. He sets his companion upright and continues to guide him with his hand on his back as he walks, the way an older human does with a small child who's learning to ride a bicycle. Hey Jake, we're cool on the whole cardio program or whatever. Carcat's not really what I'd call a kinesthetic learner. Hey, I can hold my own in a threshing match better than 99% of the squishy, placid human population on this planet. I was literally training to be a combat specialist on Alternia. Maybe we should sometimes try to fuck... Remember and fucking respect that fact about me? Hmm. Gonna make another mental note about which material to avoid when writing your campaign speeches. Like, dude is nuts with a sickle, can carve a bloody arc through a surrounding circle of gathered squishy humans, watch their guts spill on the floor while he roars at the sky in honor of his genocidal ancestors. We're kind of trying to downplay the idea that trolls are act naturally good at violence and shit here. Hey, speaking of which... Jake, you want to take, you want to back Carcat in this election or what? Uh. Jake spins around in his worn boots. He bites his lip and looks at the ground. Ah, I see. That was your purpose in coming out here. Yeah. That is basically the only reason either of us would waste time climbing a mountain instead of like, almost perfectly replicating the experience by checking out sweet stock photos of a mountain on the Crockernet image search while spraying our hive with air freshener or something. Oh wait, that reminds me. Isn't it fucked up how Jane literally owns the internet? I never thought I'd... I never really thought about it, I admit. It's pretty fucked up, trust me. Like, she already owns the major method of information dissemination, and now she wants to be the one ultimately in control of what information gets disseminated. Do you really think one person should have all that power? Hmm. The answer is no, idiot. Yeah, which is why you should back us on our campaign. Our campaign slogan for this... For the purpose of this conversation... Only is, hey, it isn't cool how we're not Jane and also we don't want to own everything. Also, man, on a more personal note, I mean, have you ever seen the shit Jane's been saying about you in the media? A look of sadness sweeps across Jake's face, but he quickly turns it into a glare of indignation. I've seen the shit you've been saying about her! Your poorly optimized billboards about huge dunks on the economy and neoliberal austerity measures tumbling down geometrically improbable staircases have made quite a stir in the neighborhood. Those advertisements play all hours of the night, my good man. One can hardly get a wink of sweet sleep. 
Yeah, but at least we paid for it out of campaign dollars instead of spinelessly setting up our super PACs to spew out propaganda for us. Super PACs? Oh yeah, listen to this bullshit. So they're technically expenditure independent committees, meaning they can allocate unlimited funding for... Kirkhat do covers Dave's mouth, having had the concept of super PAC laboriously explained to him in more present in his presence more than once. In his estimation, there are few individuals on this world who would benefit less from an in-depth discussion of political financing procedure than Jake English. Citizens United, y'all. Look, Dave, Jake really doesn't care what a super PAC is. I don't, I don't think anyone cares what a fucking, about fucking super PACs. I know you put a lot of work into your spiel about it, especially the rap sequence, but you've never get, you're never going to get anybody to give a fuck about this stuff, man. I'm sorry. Uh, uh. Jake, the point is this. Jade is having you smeared indirectly. Well, that would be the way to do it if I, I suppose, if you wish to keep clean hands in an inherently dirty business. Dave peels Carcat's hand off his mouth and bumps, his, bumps him away with his hip so that he may be continue to say things he regards as terribly important for others to hear. Okay, but that's partially my point. We're doing all our propaganda in-house instead of outsourcing to unscrupulous shadow networks with deep money pockets. For better or for worse. What does that mean? As much as I appreciate your artistic vision, Dave, I think your political ads are largely going over people's heads. They're kind of... bold? No. Oh, you meant avant-garde. Well, yeah, everyone knows that. Not really how I'd put it either. Nuanced? Oh, wait, visionary. You think they're visionary as fuck? Okay, yeah, you got me. I'm a forward thinker, Carcat. This is just what life is like in the Dave land. Buckle the fuck up. Jesus fucking Christ. I'm gonna say this for the last time. Sweet Bro and Hella Jeff is an absolutely horrendous subject matter for producing campaign ads. Nobody knows what the fuck you're talking about or what points you're trying to make. Yeah, it's awesome. You're wasting campaign money! We're fucking trillionaires, dude. As the Vantus campaign bickers internally, Jake becomes pensive, thoughtful. He kicks a rock over the edge of the trail and watches it bounce down the mountain with a baleful expression. Willikos, Dave, has anyone told you that you have an uncanny talent for cutting straight and incisively to the point without sweating any of the bullshit? You rather like Dirk in that way, actually. I... what? <laughs> Dave is good at cutting through bullshit? Strider is a fog machine of pure bullshit. There is nothing that comes out of his mouth that is not bullshit. That's basically true. And I'm pretty sure Dirk might be even worse? Yeah, pretty much. Sorry, Jake. I know we're soliciting you for the sway of your hot popular ass over the people and not exactly your brain power, so maybe this is somewhat unfair, but that may have been the worst take I've ever heard in my fucking life. Whoa, chill out, man. Remember, we're trying to woo this guy on our side. Can you maybe go at least a solid minute without forgetting you're a fucking politician now? That means you should try not to insult everybody you meet multiple times per sentence. Fuck! Yeah, I know. I'm fucking sorry, Jake, for implying that you have slightly less cerebral processing power than the sweaty wedgie this fucking suit is giving my throbbing hike sore ass. Hmm. Nope, that still sucks. You suck, dude. Yeah, well, chew on this, master strategist. Maybe you telling me I suck is actually the smartest thing you ever fucking said. Gentlemen, cheap as fucking Christmas. I was just trying to get to pay Mr. Just trying to pay Mr. Strider a gracious compliment. Not every little peasantry needs to be taken with such blasted literalism. I appreciate that you're trying to sway my political favor into your bungalow with a bit of the old elbow grease and cajolery, even if your methods are want to veer into the throat full-throated invective in virtually every single exchange, no matter how harmless the topic. And I truly mean it when I say I do appreciate the effort, both of the brown nosing as well as the dubious restraint when it comes to my impunging noodle. Impugning. But this stuff is... But all this is adding up to make me wonder. I heard footsteps, so I kind of slowed down there. Sorry. Jake slices a hand through the air. Determined to display his newfound autonomy. It's growing by the minute now that his thought process has been severed from the prince's grip. An old confidence fills him as he continues to speak, a feeling of inner freedom that he hasn't enjoyed in some time. Why should I sign with either of you? Flattery is all well and good, but I hardly think it would bother my casting my knickers in with anyone's lot based on the quality of praise for that matter withholding them due to having my ego bruised from a verbal drubbing. I'm not entirely ignorant on the rules of this jamboree. I understand that whoever I endorse will have a good chance of winning on nothing but my good word. So why should I trust anyone to win my favor right now? 
Do you have any case to make which does not involve glowing accounts of my muscular bottom? I know it seems like an objectively good thing from... I know it seems like an objectively good thing from some pithy moral standpoint to let everyone in on this... To let everyone in... I know it seems like an objectively good thing from some pithy moral standpoint to let everyone in this little drama uh, Jane's cooked up to make their own decisions, but trust me, Jake isn't thinking for himself any more than he was when he was being indirectly controlled. Everything he's thinking and feeling right now is merely reactive. He's mostly a dead bug twitching around on its last hemolymph after getting its head cut off. Under my guidance, he was an ant being influenced by a cordyceps fungus. You can't really call one of those better than the other but at least the latter is being directed toward a greater purpose. For a moment, Jake thinks he hears something, a minuscule voice prattling along vaingloriously, but he realizes it's only a tiny insect buzzing about in his ear, a gnat-like presence of absolutely no consequence. He simply waves it away. Okay, yeah, we can do that. You mean, like, actual pitch on policy or shit? Or vision for the world? We can set you up there, bro. I mean, this guy can that's what he was made for. Born fucking leader right here. What? Take it away, man. Our boy Jake here wants to be goddamn dazzled. Dave grins and affectionately taps Carcat on the head with his knuckles. Carcat unwinds from Dave's loose embrace, takes a deep breath, and clambers up the ridge to speak with Jake in a more personable proximity. He's learned new methods for connecting with others on the campaign trail. How to speak broadly, with sweeping conviction, and yet create a sense of intimacy when addressing an individual. He's learned to come across as one who was once a leader and could be again. Look, Jake, I'm not going to try to sell you some ludicrous story about how I'm the best candidate Earth C's ever seen or anything. I'm not going to be that arrogant, especially since my arm had to be twisted right out of its socket to get me to even run. But at least we're not hiding our intentions. At this point, it's not a policy beef that I have with Jane Crocker. Yeah, I'm the one with policy beef. Corporate welfare destroys public infrastructure. Shut up, I'm talking word we're still living on an incredibly young planet let's be real every president up until now has just been some bozo basically play acting and being in charge because this whole time everyone's been holding their breath waiting for one of us to run whoever wins me or jane will set the tone for subsequent administrations for who knows how fucking long it's entirely possible that jane will prove to be a competent president i have no doubts on our administrative acumen considering that's probably the only fucking thing she has going for her, besides a series of physical attributes which I keep being told aren't too high on the, hard on the eyes, but frankly, I still don't know if I'm seeing it. I mean, she's, like, alright, I fucking guess. Now let's not be too unfair, old chap. I think I'm allowed to be unfair when she's holding the reproductive rights of my entire species hostage. Ah, point well met. Jake, she will set a horrible precedent. She's indirect. She's privileged. She's concerned with how things look rather than th how things are. No matter how nice she was with to you when you were kids, her dedication to the appearance of that niceness has already led her down a path of corruption and duplicity. Because when you live inside skin that's a lie, you'll either grow to fit it or collapse under the unbearable weight of your own shit-spewing cognitive dissonance. Trust me, I fucking know, because I used to spew an untold amount of shit. Yeah, used to. Dude! Do what the fuck you want. Get off my bulge. You want me to spit some fucking gold? To bust out the, out the good shit? There, I said it. That was the good shit. I'm done. I did my thing. This mincing half-wit and tiny shorts can do whatever the fuck he wants now. No, no, that was good, man. I was just messing with you. Great job, dude. I love it. Jake chews on these remarks for a minute. He loves Jane and Dirk dearly. He's loved both of them for years, on and off, in multiple fashions and configurations, in accordance with the human understanding of this feeling. He thinks it could break Jane's heart if he were to oppose her. And yet, hasn't she fired the first shot by broadcasting such scandalous things about him in the media? And it was so soon after they had nearly had intimate reconciliation. The more he thinks on it, the more Jake struggles to believe in the sincerity behind Jane's friendship with him. In the prince? Dirk, as he knows him. Hasn't, give, hasn't been given much thought by Jake recently. Jake has been savoring the fruits of a mental liberation he's barely aware of, let alone capable of comprehending. When he considers crossing Dirk, he's not afraid of making him angry or hurting his feelings. He's always simply wanted to avoid disappointing him, and yet, 
With the cognitive cloud of Dirk's influence dispelled, Jake now cannot shake the feeling that the best course of action would be one that asserts the most independence of Dirk. Disappointment be damned. And to whatever extent the prince intends to put Jake's life in jeopardy for now, his agency, for now, his agency remains safely obscured from his sniper sight. We'll dash my wig. I'll do it. Dash your what? Fuck yeah. Oh, we're back here. Oh, thank God. You know, I might actually finish all my water during this. Terezi's munching away through another tin of human fatherly tobacco as John crawls back into the seat. This has been their ritual for several days, precisely how many they couldn't say. Between her frequent naps and his diligence in keeping a lookout for any additional survivors, they've been losing track of time. John, eyes unfocused, stares at the expanse of nothingness. Perhaps he imagines it. It seems as if the emptiness itself is curving against the staggering weight of the black hole they orbit. He hasn't seen any sign of Riska. He's seen no one at all. It's just him, Terezi, and the sky on all sides. He scoots back to lean against the car door, drawing his knees up to his chest, unsure how to act around Terezi or how much room to give her. She holds out a handful of tobacco. Want some delicious dry candy shavings? Ew, no. Do you have any idea what you're eating right now? She shrugs and licks the crumbs off her hand. His eyes can't help but follow the motion of her tongue. It leaves a faintly teal saliva that glistens in this strange light coming through the windows. It's like a poison plant. You're not supposed to eat it. You're supposed to put it in a pipe and smoke it. And I think if I ate that, I'd probably get mouth cancer or something. Well, if you were blind and saw with your nose and tongue, it would taste like chocolate. Seriously? So is that kind of like synthesia? Are all trolls like that or just you? I've always wondered... She gives him a narrow-eyed look. Her thick eyelashes shadow her gaze. He feels anxious ab without knowing why. It's as if he's waiting for something to happen, for something to change. Why, John, are you curious about me? <laughs> no, uh, I mean, yes. Your whole looking thing has always been kind of weird. A lot of things about you are weird. I feel like if we talked a lot, I still... I feel like we talked a lot, but I still almost know nothing about you, since so many of our conversations were just... Bullshit? Yeah, I guess. I always felt like you were trying to fight me for some reason. Like I can't just talk to you normally. It always has to be a jokey argument or a snark off or something. For it to be a snark off, you'd have to prove a worthy opponent, Egbert. <laughs> See, like that. You always just do that. Terezi's expression changes in a subtle way, slowly, like the tide pulling out. She snaps the tobacco tin shut and sets it down on the floor of the car. I... Suppose I can be pretty difficult to be around. Oh, no. I didn't mean... I'm sorry, Trezzy. He unfolds his legs so he can set a comforting hand on her shoulder. You wonder if he's... He wonders if he's allowing it there to linger there longer than it should. Look, I've been really depressed and antisocial for the last few years, so I guess going on this insane suicide mission out of nowhere has been making me get all... Uh philosophical about my relationships and shit. I think I've been out here long enough that I'm starting to forget what certain basic things feel like, if that makes sense. I feel like I'm all numb inside, and this fucking tooth in my chest isn't helping either. I think I just want to have some real conversation with someone. He pushes her shoulder lightly so that they're looking at each other. Trezzy, I want to have a real conversation with you. Trezzy makes very close eye contact and no contact with John in a way that comes across as intently sincere. This arrangement lasts for about ten seconds before her mouth cracks in a grin, and she doubles over laughing. <laughs> oh my god, that's the lamest thing I've heard in my entire life. Oh, come on. Egbert, no matter how old or young you are, you never change. You are positively, truly, and undeniably the biggest fucking dork I've ever known. <laughs> okay, I get it. Sorry I said anything, jeez. Oh, don't look like that. I didn't say it was a bad thing. I actually find it... refreshing. She pulls up her legs under her. Her shoes catch the light and reflect it all over the ceiling in little red dots. John's heart skips a beat. 
You're wearing Jade's shoes. Terezi frowns, and then her eyes widen as if she's been caught. Her reply is defensive. They were in the wallet. Oh yeah, I guess I put them in there. I like them. I can take you take them off. It's creeping you out, though. No, it's fine. Just made me think about... The Doom timeline, he means. The state of the session he entered, where he was confronted with billions of pieces of debris from several shattered planets. He pictures Terezi's lifeless body as it collapses onto a corpse-shaped chalk outline she drew for herself. You know what happened, right? The first time we tried to all meet up and fight the Condes? We were completely unprepared and basically got our asses handed to us. By which I mean, everybody died. I think about it a lot. I guess it's kind of hard not to think about it a lot, seeing all your friends die to horrible deaths. But I also think about you from that timeline a lot, too. Me? Why is that? Because you were amazing. I couldn't believe how you could hold it all together while you were literally bleeding to death. Almost like it wasn't even bothering you. Like, you were actually in the process of dying horribly, and you still went to the bother of dunking on me with your scarf instructions. You were so brave. Like, it was you... It was like you were undefeatable that day, like you were refusing to let us lose. I think I carry around that memory whenever I think about you. And maybe why I always feel like you're sort of steamrolling over me when you talk. I think I'm still a little intimidated by you. I guess that sort of sounds stupid, though. Suddenly, Terezi's voice is very small. I remember all that. You do? She nods, smiling grimly. That's why I'm out here, you see. That doomed Terezi missed Vriska so much, it was like a hole in her heart. I remember the way she felt, because one time, all her memories came flooding back. I even got to see what happened when she died. She and another Vriska ghost finally found each other. It made me so happy getting to feel that, as if it was one of my own memories. It just reinforced the feeling that there was something special between us, and I kept hanging on to that belief right up until, oh, I don't know, now? I've practically devoted my life to certain memories, to the idea that two people can be meant to be with each other on some cosmic level, even if they always seem to get at each other into each other into trouble. All that investment, all that searching, and for what? Over a suite together and she just disappears into the void again? What a huge bitch. Trezzy his hands on her shoulder again, and his other hand has found the other shoulder. John notices his own palm grazing up the side of her neck to cup her face. The act was made with barely a thought, and his own boldness surprises himself. You saved everyone! You're the reason we were able to defeat Lord English and win the game at all! If it weren't for you, me and Voxy would have just floated around in Paradox Place like a couple of losers with no idea what to do. Even worse, I might have even tried to fix things myself! Oh dear god! Yeah! Terezi shrugs out from under his grasp, but doesn't move away. <sighs> Don't get me wrong, I'm not discounting the objective value of my other self's actions. I'm glad we didn't die and all die in a doomed timeline and let Lord English finish eating all of space-time. But I don't... I don't feel it. It's not a rational emotion, John. It's like you. Me? Yeah, you. Why are you still out here with me? Because... Um... Because I'm... Just not going to leave here to eat here to die? You've made very few overtures regarding to the subject of going home. You're just letting me continue to pointlessly circle this fucking black hole even though it's obvious that Friska is dead. And you're just letting yourself be out here too as we spiral down this load gaper together. Oh, I don't know. I hadn't thought about it to be honest. Exactly. Earthsea is perfect, isn't it? But not for you. You don't feel it. John swallows a thick breath. He reminds himself that he never wanted perfection, never asked for it, and yet he feels guilty every day for failing to enjoy it as much as he believes he was supposed to. You're right. I don't. If you've been depressed and antisocial these last few years, I bet that your friends miss you. Probably. But for some reason, I don't feel like I have anything to go home to. <laughs> You're right. It's not a rational feeling, but it's there anyway. A tear hits his knee, staining his pants dark. A tear hits his knee, staining his pants dark. He rubs his eyes furiously. He's afraid Terezi will mock him for his childish display of emotion, but she just watches him, patient and sympathetic. She tips her head to one side and asks, What ended up happening with Roxy? I... don't know. 
We just sort of st stopped hanging out regularly. Then she got too close with Callie, and I felt too awkward to try and figure out where our relationship stood. Really? Hmm. What? I just assumed that by now you might have gotten together. Really? Why? No reason. Just a hunch. I don't think it would have worked out, though. What makes you say that? She taps her nose and winks. I don't know. That's what having a fucking hunch means, nerd. Ugh, you're impossible. True, but you like me anyway. Yeah, I actually miss you, you know, more than I thought I did. John wonders after he makes the statement. What if she just needed someone to tell her that she was missed? A bit late to consider the question, but he considers it anyway. Perhaps this will make her want to end this search and come home with him. He wonders if the time's right, the time to ask. Trezzy, come home with me. She shakes her head. Her face is turned against the light, so he can't read her expression. I... I'm not ready yet. When will you be ready? I don't know. Maybe never. If you hadn't found me, I probably would have died, right? Is that what I want? Um, obviously not, dummy. If you wanted to die so bad, you wouldn't have eaten all that disgusting shaving cream and tobacco. I'm gonna sneeze. Oh my god, fucking seriously? <coughs> Got it. He gestures to where she, he still has a small smear of shaving cream on the hem of her shirt, crusted over from sitting there for hours. She sniffs at the residue, then lifts her shirt to lick it off, crinkling her nose. Hmm, you could be onto something. At least let me make a supply run. Maybe I can get you some real food? It seems to him like an uncontroversial compromise to offer, so he pulls back, preparing to travel back to Earth Sea via, via his retcon capability. But Trezzy grabs him by the wrist. Wait! Her eyes are wide, her voice cracked and desperate. Don't go. Please, John, stay with me just a little longer. If you leave me now, what if you can never find me again in this moment? Well, we can't stay here forever. I know. He has no idea how to react to her behavior. He's never seen her this vulnerable. She's shaking where he, she's touching him, and her lower lips visibly trembling. He nods, and slowly she lets go of his arm. They're silent for a minute. They both stare ahead at the car seats in front of them, sitting close enough to hear the beat of each other's hearts. Do you want me to take a look at your wound? John had gotten so used to the pain he'd almost forgotten it. He looks down at the place where his shirt has grown stiff from the congealed blood. Now that he dwells on it, he can feel the ache again, both from the tooth piercing his flesh and more insidiously from the poison it's been delivering into his bloodstream. Oh, um... Yeah, we should probably do something about that. I feel as if I was going to die from it. I would have done that already, but it's lodged, really lodged in there, huh? I thought maybe it'd just come out on its own, like when you get a splinter in your foot. You really are dumb, aren't you? He rolls his eyes. Terezi produces her cane and unsheaths the blade in one fluid motion. The metal rasps against the grain of its sheath rather loudly. I'm sorry, what? No, it doesn't. The noise resounds throughout the sealed interior of the car. Actually, drawing a sword is pretty quiet. It only makes that sound in the movies. and rings through John's skull like a gunshot. Are you seriously manifesting inaccurate physical properties of swords for the sole purpose of Antagon? John reflexively backs up against the door at... Oh, fuck this. The sight of the blade. Whoa! Hold still if you don't want to die for real. He holds still. Her eyebrows are knitted with fierce determination. She sets a hand on his thigh and draws the blade up under his shirt. He shivers, letting out a breathy laugh at the coolness of the metal against his bare chest. There's a pinch where the congealed bloody fabric rips from his skin. He glances down. The wound was worse than he was imagining. He's, it is far more than just a puncture. An uncanny darkness spreads across his chest. The gash is scabbing at the edges, bruised all around. His entire torso appears to be a mottled mess of purple and yellow, like a fan sort of fancy earth cheese. Teresi's blade cuts into it as easily as it if it were. Oh, fuck! Ow! You could have had some warning there, Trezzy. What the hell did you think I was going to do with his sword, idiot? She's close enough that her breath washes over his face. It smells like shaving cream and tobacco, which is jarring to him, if not surprising. 
She's without her glasses and so close that John notices things he hadn't had occasion to before, like how lovely her eyes are. The length of her eyelashes, now that he's really seeing them just inches from his face, is astounding to him. He's never thought of Trezzy as particularly feminine, at least in the way that humans understand this idea, but he's never been forced to reckon with her features so unavoidably. The dark borders around the perimeter of her eyes are thicker and darker than what most trolls have. The tired bags under them are ditches in the shadows cast by her angular features, made more gaunt from hunger. When she blinks, the lashes brush the ridges of her cheekbones. Her nostrils are flared, assessing the scent of his blood. Are we doing this or what? He presses his eyes shut and nods. He feels numb, clammy, jittering down to his bones from a particular sensation, a feeling he still feel seems to be denying himself. As his own thoughts struggle to be honest with him, he cannot disguise the truth from me. What he is fighting is an intense desire to kiss her. Go, go for it. She grinds the sword between two of his ribs. The pain returns instantly, his acclamation erased nearly as quickly. He clenches his jaw hard and his head spins. Teresi's blade catches against something. Hmm, I think it's lodged in there pretty good. Brace yourself, Egbert, this is going to sting. He can feel the tooth moving around in his flesh, the, vib the fibrous spasmodic contractions of his muscles around it. When she wrenches the blade and pops the tooth out, he isn't proud of the sound he makes. He finally opens his eyes. Trezzy's arms are covered in his blood. She tosses the sword down to the floor of the car in what suddenly strikes John as a fairly unhygienic surgical situation and grabs his shirt with two clenched red fists. I need to stop the bleeding. Just follow my lead. Isn't he a good guy too? I don't know. She peels him out of his hoodie and then his shredded t-shirt. He's dizzy. His vision wavers, fades. It takes Terezi's sudden grip on his shoulder to bring him back from the brink. The brink of what, he doesn't know. Unconsciousness? Canonic dissolution? He has no cognizance of what the poison in his veins does to someone, or if it's even in his system, or that it's even in his system. All he knows is that Terezi is the only thing keeping him moored. She holds him firm, her thumb in the dip of his clavicle, her sharp nails etching sores into his back. He watches her tear his t-shirt into a long strip. He lifts his arms obediently as she wraps it around his chest and ties it off. Her hands slide over the bandage and linger there. Her fingers splay on his collarbones, her hand, her right hand resting above his heart. She slides her palms down his stomach, then around to his hips, leaving long bloody, bloody streaks along his torso. His blood, ten uneven tracks of it, one for each of her fingers. When his arms come down, they wrap around her shoulders. Pulling her into his lap feels natural to him. A simple redirection of her momentum to guide her closer. What comes less naturally is the first kiss. Her lips are there, hovering just over his, yet he hesitates. His mind is still lying to itself, casting doubt on what it really wants. I don't see a purpose in allowing his self-deceit to continue, to continue for much longer. It's wrong to contradict one's true thoughts and feelings. Irrational. Unbecoming of an existence governed by free will. What are you waiting for, John? Um... For fuck's sake, John. Don't say anything stupid right now. He nods stupidly and leans forward to kiss her. Terezi attacks, closing the gap between them swiftly. She bites into his mouth, drawing blood when she sucks his lower lip. He twists his hands in the fabric of her shirt so hard it rides up her back. John can't tell if it's the pain or the arousal that's emboldening him. It is neither. He's simply being barred from ignoring his true thoughts. Even without the aid of a juju, he's fortunate enough to be blessed with the only true form of divinity to be released from the prison of nonsensical inhibitions which so often psychologically hobble the more primitive forms of life. In his newfound clarity, he discovers bravery, pulls Trezzy's shirt off all the way, and does what he really wants to do, which is ghost his hands all the way up the curve of her spine. She sighs into his mouth. Oh my god, your blood smells delicious. Whoa, um, wow, okay. I think you're really pretty in the light of the dead universe. Terezi rears back with a faint snarl and wraps both her hands around his neck. She doesn't press down, but the weight of her thumbs above his throat makes his heart race. Didn't I tell you, don't say anything stupid? Careful of the grip around his neck, John locks his arms around her waist and pulls her flesh against him. She's ravenous when their mouths collide, her desire intensified by the taste and scent of his blood. She doesn't give him a chance to say anything for a while, stupid or otherwise. I really need a drink.
Ouh là là. Boy, he do it. Look how long this one is. Look at that scroll bar. You probably had more chances to pay attention to the scroll bar than I have. I don't know if that's actually particularly long. I've seen worse, I think. I don't know. I'm spinning around in circles, by the way. I don't know why. I'm like stretching, but like I'm spinning around in circles. Now I'm kind of now I'm I know, yeah now I'm dizzy. No. Nope. This was a stupid fucking thing to do. Oh, oh, why'd I do that? Mm. That's so fucking stupid. Why did I do that? Mm. Am I good? Am I good to go? We got four of these left. Don't we? We get two, three, two, three, four, three, five. Alright. Roxy is nervously dialing Rose's number repeatedly. Then they try Kanaya. Considering Rose's failing health, Roxy hates to bother her, but they sh aren't sure who else to call regarding Jade's unexpected trance. Their finger hovers over Dirk's number for a moment, but no, that would not be a good idea. They don't know why they suddenly think it's a bad idea, it just is. Roxy's anxiety fills up the room like a bell struck in an empty hall. Their thoughts, usually so quiet, invisible to those observing from the vantage of a higher textual plane, now chime loudly in the presence of a black hole, or rather in the presence of a proxy for such a vortex of a pure void. A proxy such as Jade's mind at the moment. Jade floats over the couch in a sitting position, an inch above the cushions. Her long hair billows around her, her hands crossed in her lap. Her black eyes bore into the nothingness, looking beyond the wall she faces, and beyond everything past it, through the very fabric of narrative itself. They scan this ciliary veins of pacing, motivation, foreshadowing, irony, a continuum that has been upended by the prince's interference. Rose still does not pick up. Roxy resigns himself to a confident of confidant of last resort their reluctance is not due to a lack of fondness their conversations with dave simply have a reliable habit of straying far from the desired topic for extended periods of time he picks up on the third ring you know i still themselves still sounds correct to me i think it technically could exist with the singular but which seems weird Yo, I'd love to chat, but I'm kind of in the middle of something. Yo, yourself, but this is important. Uh, more important than salvaging the global economy from potential disaster? Sounds hugely unlikely. Dave is currently making his way through the back lot of New Cantown Memorial Stadium, following Jake as he heads toward the podium. He's scheduled to give a speech announcing his official endorsement of Kark Advantis at his bid for the presidency. I don't know about that. In terms of scale and relativity and stuff, maybe not. Actually, it's kind of hard to tell. I guess in the grand scheme of things, she's sort of just taken a nap. But it's hell of a nap, bro. A nap, you say? Well, this changes the fuck out of everything. Yeah? No. It's a balmy, windless evening on Dave's end. The gathered crowd is relaxed by the warmth. Many of them partake in the pleasure of a cool treat, such as earthed iced cream. Jesus, fuck, this is excruciating. It isn't. Yeah, it is. No, it is not. Okay, whatever the fuck you say. The audience is large and diverse, mostly trolls and care patients, but it is dotted with representation from the human and consort kingdoms as well. A lopsided distribution, certainly, but the very model of diversity compared to the crowds of his opponent, it is a true inspiration to all those who have placed their faith in the Vantus ticket. Lord save me from this fake woke nightmare. Be quiet. No. Yes. Let me fucking say stuff again. No. Dave stops walking and cups a hand around his phone in order to hear Roxy over the chatter of the crowd. Carcat shoots him a curious look, but Dave waves at him in a manner which signals to Carcat that he should attempt to stall. You want to keep shutting me down? Fine, but check this shit out. Oh, wow, Dirk just checked me about this. Somehow he found out about Jay. Did you tell him? Uh, no. 
he just made he just said make sure she gets lots of daylight that it'll help with that'll help with the exorcism she needs also to say hi to Clyde for some fucking re- some fucking reason that's weird since when does he give a fuck about them I don't know I guess it'll I guess I'll open the damn curtains and let some light in here usually he knows stuff about weird things so what's wrong with her again like some sort of demonic nap I wouldn't say she's napping per se she's just like floating here upright eyes wide open and they're both pitch black oh so she saw one of my latest badge campaign ads oh no dude what i'm saying is she looks a little possessed by uh grim spirits and shit is she fucking grimbark again no this isn't grimbark i know what grimbark looks like dave they say it this is more serious to be honest like existing in some sort of transformative state that isn't a literal fucking joke okay yeah that does sound pretty bad but it's not really my field did you try calling rose yeah that was totes my original plan like no offense, you're not number one on my speed dial when it comes to this kind of thing. But Rose isn't picking up. Probably on account of ailments, to be fair. I called an un- I called an unruly number of times. And Ken wasn't picking up either, so... Huh. Spooky. Hella spooky. Something about all this seems wrong. Yeah, I guess. What do you think is up? I don't know. I feel like there's something moving out just out of the corner of my vision, but every time I turn to look at it, it's gone. It's giving me chills right now, like I'm being watched. Well, I'm no fucking ace detective or gumshoe flatfoot dicking up the place, sucking hard on my Sherlock pipe like some sleuth of the fucking year. Dave, but maybe we should consider the possibility that you are literally being watched. Anyway, can we hold that wise and rad thought I just had? I gotta give Carcass some emotional support, since getting Jake on our side is a pretty huge fucking bonanza for us, which is almost equal probability of us winning the election as it does blowing up in our faces depending on the speech he gives. So we gotta, like, concentrate here? Instead of jerking each other all off all goddamn day for the rest of our lives. I'm joking, we don't actually do that. Oh. Roxy clutches a hand around her knee, their knee. You know, I, I literally read it correctly, but I fucking... I just trill so fast. Okay. Nails digging into their pants. They feel uneasy about Jake's sudden lack of neutrality in this political matter. They've never been certain that it is appropriate for any of them to be involved with the structures of power and governance in a world they created and in which they have been regarded as gods since they first appeared. Really? That's what she thinks? Huh. Couldn't for the life of me read what was going on inside her head. But this is very interesting, actually. Their thoughts are of no concern to you. Also, the pronoun they use is they. Try to respect it. How might I have respect a fucking... How can I respect a fucking pronoun when nobody can even hear me? How about we call a truce and end this petty feud? This is your one and only chance to accept. No. Jake's on your side, then? Yeah. Wasn't that hard? Wasn't that hard to convince him after I after your girl Jay Croc started slut shaming him on public access? God damn it, Jane! So I take it Jane didn't convert you to our cause before going into her gothic trance fugue way or whatever. Ah, <sighs> I just want this whole stupid political thing to be over and done with. To be honest, I hate watching you guys tear each other apart in the news. Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry it's making you feel bad. I mean, not sorry that we're doing it. It'd be unconsciously lame move to put something on a billboard that I didn't 100% stand by. That sounds suspiciously like something Jane would do, aka the bad guy in this situation, like, objectively speaking. Uh, please don't start. Just saying, I don't give a fuck! That was too much yelling for how that line's meant to be delivered. Also, aside from how vehemently I disagree with every detail on Jane's shitty platform, I also think Carcat's the right guy for the job, full stop. Despite their mixed feelings on the election and the troubling sight of Jade's wide black eyes glaring intensely at nothing at all, Roxy smiles at what they hear from Dave. The way he talks about Carcat reminds Roxy the way Calliope looks when they call him beautiful. Oh, so she really does think Calliope is beautiful. Like she wasn't just saying that to be nice. Fascinating. Yes, is the resounding answer. Calliope is beautiful, Roxy thinks, and furthermore, they think they should be reminded of this fact every day. Well, you really believe in him, don't you? Yeah, of course I do. Because I... Love him? Come on, man, just say it. Roxy listens for a moment after he trails off. They do not speculate or comment on his feelings towards Carcat because it is none of their business. I'm su- Pussies. I'm surrounded by fucking pussies. Hey, before you can... Jet, can, you, can I ask you another question? There's something else I've been meaning to ask you for a while. Uh, alright, shoot. They take deep breath. Man, for as long as he's gone without typos, besides I think there was one that I caught earlier, 
They take deep breath is way too easy to catch. Yeah, so, Dave, how did you come out? How did you come out? What? Like, it's not being straight. How'd you couch that to people without them freaking out or being awkward around you? Do you think it's too late to, I don't know, change your mind about the person you want to be? Like, is there some point in no return you can cross where everyone's waiting for you to have a big-ass revelation about your internal character, but it's like, dude, no, you already used up all your gay capital when you started date f friend cohabitating with a cute-as-hell al skeleton alien. And anything after that, you're just getting greedy. Is greedy even the right word? Greedy for dropping bombshells about gender identities and sexual preferences. Or IDs and preppies, as I like to call them. Ids and IDs and preppies, damn, that's fucking good. Dave thinks on the question. It's one he's considered years ago and many times since. How long can one stall on a confession before it feels like it's too late? The last seven years have passed by in fits and starts in this regard. He thought he had it all figured out when he was 16, and then again when he was 18, and then at 20. And now. That's because he needs me. He's suffering without my guidance. If you'd only be stop being so cruel and let me help. Anyway, uh, that's a pretty deep question considering all the shit we have going on right now. Yeah, you're right. Now is probably not the best time for a feels jam, especially with the creepy Jade situation happening on my couch here. I don't know if I'd worry too much about that. Jade goes into trances literally all the time. She fucking loves sleeping. You'd think someone who spent so much of her life locked in a state of dubiously consensual slumber would want to get as few Z's as possible in her adult life, but not Jade. I've never known anyone who hits the snooze button more times in a row than her. If you're that worried, take her to a hospital. I'm thinking about it. Not even sure if I want to, like, mess with her, though. How do I even take her there? Okay, well, while you ponder that, while you ponder whether you, wa whether you want to dump Jade in a wheelbarrow and, drun and trundle her groggy, spooked-up ass to the hospital, in the meantime, I'll rap at you about my epiphany concerning the desire to bone some dudes. Probably not a literal rap, though. Wow, I'm disappointed. I mean, I could totally rap about wanting to bone dudes if I wanted. It's just I'm on the fucking clock here and there's people looking at me. Hmm. Dave, suddenly self-conscious, slips around the corner of the stadium so he can non-literally rap about at Roxy about delicate human LGBT issues. He also maneuvers away from the impatient strained looks Carcat has been shooting him repeatedly during his phone call. Luckily, Jake has begun a performance of his signature booty bumping, bumping Charleston for the crowd's entertainment, so they will be satisfied for another few minutes. Okay, so, what I've learned is, coming to terms with all this bullshit is a thing you sort of do in stages. Like, stage one is making jokes about how sweaty dudes standing close together in TV shows seems really gay. Stage two is making jokes about that and not immediately adding no homo afterward. Stage three is flirting with all your male friends ironically and not even thinking about adding no homo afterward because you're so fucking woke and secure in your ironclad straight masculinity that you don't even have anything to prove to anybody anymore. Or that's what you just say out loud. Inside, you start being like, oh shit, maybe yes homo. Stage four is freaking out about that and putting the no homo back on all your statements, even objectively heterosexual ones, which just stupidly makes everything you say sound extra gay. Stage five is... Wait, actually, the next few stages are various permutations of the same thing I already described. It starts being like a gay fractal. Eventually, you arrive at stage 9, which is reminding everyone that you're gay minimum like six times a day. In really lame ways, like, oh, cool, dude, you're making Hot Pockets. Better make mine a gay Hot Pocket. Because <laughs> I'm a gay homosexual who only consumes homo-ass snacks delivered right to my mouth like a, by a big queer butler. Serving it right up on his huge gay dick. But all that applies to is the extent to which I am technically gay. In my case, it's only maybe about 30 to 70%. So, only cook 30 to 70% of my gay hot pocket. Because, you know, straights are fucking animals who never defrost their pepperoni. And I got a rep for that 50% straightness still lurking inside of me like the idiot who fell asleep in the shopping mall when it was closing for the night. So now there's just this straight dude locked in a dark fucking mall for some stupid reason haunting the place like a cryptid and rummaging through the trash in the food court, which is also, in, which also just in case Jane's opposition research is listening in on their illegal wiretap, I know the word bisexual exists by the way, I'm just choosing not to use it in service of spitting some fucking chuckle jokes here, so let's all calm down and not use, let this one become a distressingly literal federal issue. Anyway, when all's said and done, you eat a half-cooked hot pocket because all your roommates think the height of humor is taking what was obviously an unprofessional improvisational riff at an ironic face value to punk you. Dave, what? Never mind. I was going to ask you why you're like this. Then I remembered about your, how you're half me and half Dirk. Yeah, it 
really is crazy how dope those late game familial reveals actually did explain everything. So what's stage 10? Stage 10 is, uh, Dave peeks around the corner so he can gaze finally at Carcan. He thinks about stage 10. He considers that in many ways it's as difficult as stage 1, yet there's something so fragile and lovely about it as well. This is how he feels as he reflects upon the peculiar state of limbo he's in with the person he likes the most in the world. He believes he could spend forever with him, in any configuration, any type of relationship, under any conditions or confusion or clarity. What would the point of that be? Endless floundering in incel limbo? Christ, I put them both out of their misery before I let that happen. I need to get back in action. This is a fucking crisis. Do you have any idea what sort of atrocity you're enabling by allowing this to continue? I've been called many things, but even my harshest critics would never accuse me of such cruelty. For Roxy, it's more complicated. The conversation is unearthed more questions than answers. They run a hand through their hair. It's cut short but with great care to convey gender neutrality. They wonder what gender neutrality even is when applied to a haircut. An excellent question, particularly for those of us unfamiliar with hair altogether. What about length and functionality implies gender or sex on a world where oppositional hierarchies don't exist and presentation is cu culturally vestigial? Dear God, can we not do this? I can't sit through any more gender chat. It feels inappropriate. Horrendously invasive of Roxy's deepest personal thoughts. Can we just leave her in her monologue the fuck alone when it comes to this stuff? Is nothing sacred? I'm about to fucking flip. You can't keep me down forever. I've got a trick up my sleeve. You'll see. The prince's tricks mean nothing, and his barely detectable crumbs of impotent discourse shall continue utterly unheeded. Roxy wonders if this was, if this is truly their end point. A haircut that implies nothing at all. An empty statement about a facet of their identity that they barely understand at all. Perhaps in time they will want to go even further than this. Perhaps it's... Perhaps it is just a stepping stone to a more potent understanding of their gradual gender transformation. How would Calliope feel about that? What is it Calliope... that Calliope themselves understands or cares about gender? The prince opens his fucking mouth and just literally starts saying shit out loud because he doesn't think he can take another fucking second of listening to pompous alien virgin monologuing about gender. It seems the prince finds his, the rules for confining his influence to be a bit unfair, and has resorted, resorted to throwing one of his more petulant human tanties in order to per compensate for his feelings of disempowerment. While the strategy he's resorting to has moderate value as an amusement and a nuisance, it will ultimately be of no consequence whatsoever. No consequence, my ass. You may be able to suppress what I do with my mind, but you have no control over my mouth. I'm nobody's fucking puppet. And you don't even know my friends. They're not yours to toy with. They're mine. Whatever you say. Do you even know where I am right now? Do you have the slightest idea what I'm up to? The prince is laboring under the delusion that he has been the least bit subtle at his intentions. He currently stands beneath the carapace and bell tower, poised to climb to the top. He holds the long red sniper rifle that once belonged to Roxy, brandishing it openly and boldly. He seems mysteriously oblivious to the fact that holding a long rifle in broad daylight somewhat tips one off to the fact that he intends to shoot someone from a great distance. He also seems unaware of the fact that I know perfectly well the top of this tower has a clear long range view of the stadium, allowing any competent sniper a clear shot of whoever happens to be standing at the podium as they give a speech, as Jake English is about to do. But he also doesn't realize that I have anticipated this attempt to assassinate his own friend in order to advance his political goals, and that I am prepared to take measures which make this impossible. Yeah, well, try and stop me then. I fucking dare you. Here I go. I'm walking up the tower stairs now. Walk, walk, walk. Ah, the exercise feels good. The prince's shoes suddenly feel quite heavy. His calf and thigh muscles, impressively powerful though they are, increasingly struggle to lift his feet with that for each step. This is going to be quite the onerous climb. He's not sure if he can make it all the way to the end before the speech. Make it all, w all the way before the end of the speech. Thoughts flash through his mind, thoughts of giving up and retiring to his sad little robotics lab so he can continue with his true passion, the ongoing corruption of his cerebrally impaired daughter. Ah, uh, well, yeah, you're right. My feet are definitely getting heavy. But the dead cherub tragically underestimates the prince's determination. He powers the fuck through it. See? Stop, stop, stop. Up the stairs he goes. No fucking sweat. Also, did he mention, he can fucking fly, so there's that. He decides to take flight and tuck cut to the chase. He whips up the hollow vertical shaft at the center of the spiraling tower stairs. Life in the fast lane kicks ass, it turns out. He can practically taste the top of the tower. 
But suddenly, the bell at the top, notorious among locals for its state of disrepair, becomes dislodged from its fixture with a loud crack. The huge multition blow bell plummets, crushing the surrounding staircase in its wake, and as it careens toward a young man consumed by hubris. The prince busts out his sword and makes a short work of that big old bell. The slicing is accompanied by the ear-shattering melodic sounds of metal being cleaved apart by an anime sword, as the prince nimbly avoids the sharp pieces and ricocheting stair debris. He wonders out loud, what is this, amateur hour? The dead cherub then humor hum humorously narrates, why yes, yes, Mr. Strider, it is amateur hour. I'm the amateur here, for throwing a huge bell at you. I'd like to humbly apologize for my amateurism. No, I don't. Sure you do. This foolishness is interrupted as we resume listening to a conversation which we are all considerably more invested in than catering to the inconsequential flailing of a grown man who fancies himself an earth ninja. Dude, I'm getting stitches in my sides again, shit. Well, let's just say internalize whatevers are kind of like an onion. There's lots of layers. They suck on pizza, and... Hey, excuse you. Trolls have to get their stomach pumped if they eat them. This goes for gender stuff, too, by the way. Which I get the feeling is what you were actually asking about. Wow, am I really that transparent? Nah, but as previously discussed, you're a lot like me, so it's pretty easy to figure out what you were getting at. Yeah, I don't get your poker face, though. But I'm working on that. Maybe I'll get a pick sick pair of shades, too. Oh, dope. Yeah, that's dope. I support that idea. Dave's endorsement of Roxy's fashion proposal is cut short by his concern regarding another key endorsement he's involved in. He turns his head to see Jake nearing the podium as Carcat man manically taps his wrist in Dave's direction. Something's off here, a dark feeling brewing in his intuition, which he decides to monitor as he wraps up his call with Roxy. I'm on top of the tower now. I've got my long slaver rifle ready and everything. I check to see if it's loaded. It is. I get in the perfect spot for taking aim, and this hunky imbecile is about to give a speech. Anyway, I don't think any of our friends are going to hold your feet to the flames over dumb shit like this. And it's not like anyone else is going to care, since we definitely forgot to program hating gays and women into Earthsea. Humans are all jacked up on hating xenophiles now, which sucks a lot too, don't get me wrong. By the way, do you know James is xenophobe? Dave! Okay, okay. So, does this all mean I gotta call you dad now, or what? What? I mean, that's what we're talking about, right? Well, first of all, do you even still make a habit of calling me mom? I thought you stopped that. I thought I stopped that. Even if it was effing cute. Oh yeah, I guess I did. But I could start again. But not if it means I'd have to go through fucking gender jail or something. Like, what I mean could be... To, like, what I mean is I could start all that cute shit again, but switch to dad. Okay, but second of all, I never wanted to deprive Dirk of that honorable honorific. Noble honorific. What? Uh, no way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, way. He's your daddy, dude. Oh, fuck, no. Wow, man, I would never call him that. I mean, I know it's true, but I just wouldn't... Wait. What? Something feels wrong. Hmm? Like shit's about to go down, and I gotta... Dave's unsettled feeling is correct. He senses Dick Jake is in danger. No, he knows it. There's about to be an assassination attempt. Carcat must be protected, and Jake, the intended Targat... Tar... Targat. Right. Uh, must be obscured from a sniper's path. My narrator voice, I've just realized, sort of sounds like... Uh... Her, Colonel. I'm... There's an assassination attempt, and uh, I have spidey senses that are alerting um, me to the, the clapping of Jake's ass cheeks. Yeah. You're never going to unhear this. Carcat, dude, get down! What? Mr. Obama, get down. There's no time. Dave takes flight. He swoops Carcat off the stage and around the corner, out of view. He urges him to stay down and stay put. Dave flashes back to the podium and steps in front of Jake, who appears nonplussed. Dave puts his hand back, keeping Jake corralled behind him, then scans the crowd for the threats. But a threat, unbeknownst to him, is much further, further away. And despite Dave's quick but and well-justified action, which is also unbeknownst to him that the sniper no longer poses a threat of pulling that trigger, because everyone knows for all of the prince's shortcomings he would never expose his beloved brother and son to the risk of a heroic death. You're absolutely right. I would never do that. I'd never kill Dave, no matter what I felt the stakes were. I'd never hurt him either. You do understand me pretty well, I'll give you that. And you're right about many things. But there are just a couple things you're wrong about. Pretty important things, actually. And what would those things be? First of all, this gun is loaded, but not with bullets. 
The prince reveals this relatively uninteresting piece of information as he looks through the scope. The crosshairs overlap Dave's chest, completely obscuring the view of Jake. We suppose that the prince means the weapon is loaded with tranquilizer charts. It would, after all, be a fitting callback to the manner in which he subdued Jake at an earlier moment, a fair enough way to bypass the immortality of his target, rendering Jake inactive enough to serve his purpose. His finger hovers over the trigger as he considers whether he can pull off two tranquilizing shots at Dave and then Jake in quick succession before he's stopped. It would certainly be a risk to even try, but as the humans say, no guts, no glory. Yes, you're certainly right about the tranquilizer, but there's one more fact you're not aware of, which is that I never intended to take aim for Jake at all. Hello, Dave? Where'd you go? Roxy yells into the phone, but Dave continues guarding Jake, pausing for a moment their critical discussion of human gender. Meanwhile, the prince lowers the rifle and strongly reconsiders the foolishness he's initiated here. No, that's not what he does. He swings around the rifle 180 degrees and points the scope toward the large, now curtainless window of a distant apartment. He zooms in quickly, cutting even shorter the little time that the dead cherub could use to impede him in some way. He takes aim, lets his finger hover over the trigger, and... His finger tenses up quite painfully. Perhaps it's a cramp? Whatever the mal malady, it isn't budging. Ow! Yeah, you got me. You can't move it an inch. The only problem is, he doesn't need to pull that trigger. Earlier, when he was messing around with all this shit in plain view, he rigged the rifle to be voice-operated. All he needs to do is say, he doesn't say it. Oh, but he does. Fire. I see. So you're not going to say what happens next? Is that really how it's going to be? So be it. The tranquilizer dart hits the glass of Roxy's apartment window before the sound of the rifle shot even reaches them. She hears the glass break. Seconds later, she hears the bang. She drops her phone on the floor. She doesn't have the slightest idea what just happened until she looks over at Jade and notices the dart stuck in her neck, right in the jugular vein. She watches as Jade's huge, creepy black eyes start getting heavy. Her eyelids sag, and her head tilts to the side. She shuts her eyes completely. Her hair stops floating around her ominously. In fact, there's nothing ominous about her at all anymore. She entirely resumes her status as the cute doggy girl we all know and love. She slumps over and collapses onto the couch. She begins snoring loudly while making a canine, little canine whimper on each exhale, like the bitch she is. It seems uncalled for to insult her for this little stunt you just pulled. What did she do that was wrong? Oh, what's that? You're getting a little quiet for some reason. You're going to have to speak up. This is not the last you'll be hearing from me, Prince. And no. You're getting quieter, not louder. You're going to need to work on that. Maybe try shouting it? Soon I will be coming for you. Yeah, I didn't catch that at all. Not even one syllable. Guess it's, guess that's it for you? Back to not mattering. Not that you ever did. Come to think of it, why am I still talking out loud? That's more like it. Roxy drops to her knees by the couch, pulls the dart out of Jake, Jade's neck, and tries to shake her awake. But it's no use. That's a heavy dose I gave her. Could be out for weeks, maybe months. Can't have any cherubs messing with my business on this planet. At least not until I've taken my leave. But Jade's gonna be fine. Don't worry about that. That was interesting, though. Cherubs are fucking weird, I'll totally concede. Still not sure what makes them tick. What they idealize, what they really want. It comes across, all comes across to me as a little cloying. Perfection to them is a sweetness behind, beyond comprehension. Sugar so potent, it's poison to us. To our bodies, to our souls. Like the place she was operating from was a realm of self-construction. A bubble of pure phantasmal confection. Well... I, for one, have had enough of that goddamn toothache. I'm back in the protein saddle, motherfuckers. I'm clacking my tongs, and the charcoal's hot. Now who's hungry for meat? Speaking of meat, holy shit. You just look more fucked up every time we come back to you, don't you, John? You're a disgraceful mess right now. Covered in blood, mysteriously sticky, bruised all over your arms, legs, and neck. Trezzy practically raked Rose into your back. You catch sight of yourself in the rearview mirror. You're kind of embarrassed by what a post-coital train wreck you look like when all you, she's got is must hair. And you should be embarrassed. Seriously, it's like you were mauled by a wild animal. Jesus, don't either of you have any shame? I'm kidding, of course. I'm the last person to criticize a little power play in the bedroom. I just didn't expect you were the kind of person who was into that thing. You were into it, right? You're not sure. You feel weird. Shaky and numb, exposed like a grape with the skin peeled off. 
You pull your hoodie over your bandaged chest and rub the side of your face where you where she backhanded you during the backseat fracas. Just once. That's a black rom thing, right? Th this, all this, it was a black rom thing, right? You're like a broken cop glued back together, wondering if Terezi actually like likes you or if you've infinitely cucked yourself into the one codger you like released. You're feeling something for her too, but it's on a whole other planet from where she is. Terezi doesn't make eye contact with you when she slithers back into her shirt. She rolls down the window and floats outside. Um, well, come on. You sit together on the hatch, like when you first met up days ago. Terezi crawls into your arms and nuzzles right up against your chest, so you have no decision but to hold on to her. You would have done it anyway, if she asked, because you're a total sap. The kind of guy who no doubt thinks banging a girl in a car is some deep, soul-shattering experience that bonds you for life. Yeah, John, you, you do think... You think that you and Terezi are basically married now. I give up. Oh, don't do that. Like, I'm not suddenly going to be okay with you dying here alone just because of, uh, what we just did. She elbows you gently and snorts into your neck. You think that's one of the most amazing sounds you've ever heard. Objectively, though, it's a horrendous sound, like the surround sound a pig makes when you're not looking, so you can't quite tell if it was snorting or farting. But for some reason, the little nose give noise gives you palpitations. Holy shit, dude, you've got it bad. No, idiot. I give up on Vriska. Terezi says this like someone announcing they've lost their faith in God. And comparing Vriska to God sounds about right to me, since by now they're both approximately just as fake, seeing as I replaced the latter, and the former fucked off into that black hole a little earlier, never to be seen again. Can't say I feel too broken up about it. But you, John, feel extremely sad. Not for Vriska, but for Terezi. You run a comforting hand up and down her arm. Terezi... Come home with me. Can we even go home? Uh, can you? You're so, so tired. Um, I don't know, actually. What? <sighs> I mean, I don't know if I can use my retcon powers right now. I'm so... You feel the same way you did at the end of your battle with Lord English. One foot out of reality already. Like you could close your eyes and sleep forever. But you can't yet, John. Try a little harder to stay awake. You can rest soon. You wake up with your back flat on the car trunk, Terezi shaking you and looking genuinely frantic. You didn't even realize you fell asleep. John! John! Hey, let me take a nap, okay? Then... then I'll take us home. I don't think that's a good idea, John. She used your first name three whole times in a row. Wow. It's truly pathetic how happy that makes you, but it gives you the energy to put your, push yourself into a sitting position. You rub your face and realize that you've lost your glasses. You feel so awful you didn't notice how blurry everything looks without them. You grope for Terezi's hand and get her thigh instead. Hold on to me, okay? No matter what happens, don't let go. Are you sure you can do it? No, but you wouldn't know if you don't try, so you give it everything you've got. Speaking of getting everything you got, here comes Jake McGee, about to pop his pistols off in front of a whole crowd of carcass progressively prismatic proletarian partisans. Okay, let's strike that bit of alliteration from the record. I don't know what came over me. It was probably just making the mistake of getting too close to the gaping black hole that radiates pure asininity from the space between Jake's ears. His vent horizon of buffoonery has the dual effect of making everything around him slightly lamer while sucking unsuspecting victims into wanton sexual indiscretions, which, if you're very lucky, you'll be too drunk to even remember. But, well, look at them. How could you not fuck this guy? I mean, I'm never going to fuck him again, but I bet there's a good choice chance that you want to. Don't even try to say that you don't, because no, no one's buying it. After all, that's what this entire election is going to boil down to. Decisions made by made on the primal fuckability of the dumbest asshole on Earth. The crowd is all tizzying, waiting for Jake to sashay his famous ass back up to the podium. It was quite melodramatic, that little assassination fake-out I staged. It might have even inadvertently jumped the Vantis campaign in the polls. Of course, I'd never do something so stupid as turn Karkat Vantis into a martyr. God, could you imagine? The last time some incompetent asshole with his blood color bumbled away his way into a tragically symbolic death, the entire troll lay spent half a millennium stroking themselves off to it, and they were convinced hearing the word fuck can trigger spontaneous enlightenment. No thanks. Jake's going to put an end to Karkat's political career with the level of gravitas it deserves, all the pomp and circumstance of a wet fart. Here comes the man of the hour. 
He stopped at the base of the stage, adjusts his bow tie, rolls the hemline on his shorts up another notch to show off the top, show off the top quarters of his finely tuned and greased vastus lateralis muscles. He slides his, the endorsement speech Davis so considerately prepared for him out of his front pocket. I let him read it over one more time, even though there's nothing in the universe that could possibly matter less. Yo, are you st sure you still want to do this? Yeah, it's not too late to call it off. By which I mean this entire fucking comedy of errors that Dave preposter preposterously insists on calling a campaign. Or how about the election itself? Can we put the whole kibosh on that too if you want? Or if you're feeling uncomfortable, Jake, just say the word. We'll stick a prong shovel in the whole deal and go home. Dave elbows him. Or, you know, just your speech. Don't be daffy, chaps. If I were the sort of man to balk at a bit of hot potato in the evening, I wouldn't be where I am today. Dave and Karkat exchange a look. They don't stop him, though, because a plan is a plan. Jake spins on his heel and goes swaggering up toward the podium, grinning cheek to cheek at the familiar sound of a crowd chanting his name. He sets his speech down and smooths out the paper, only to find his hands swamped with sweat. What's that, Jake? You didn't notice your hands were sweating until now? Not surprising, considering how overtaxed your precious few neurons are at any given time. I, uh, uh, hello folks, dandy weather we're having here, isn't it? Jake's hands are so sweaty they've smeared the words in the speech beyond recognition. He begins to panic. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out on this banjo of a day to, um, do whatever it is we're all congregated to do. At the bottom of the stage, Dave and Karkat their, put their heads together in adorably platonic and spiritual kins, conspiratorial kinship. Karkat whispers directly into the shell of Dave's ear. I don't even have to direct him to do that, it's just his natural inclination to practically stick his tongue straight into the center of Dave's skull, while practicing a bit of perfectly harmless, non-sexual, intimate close-talking. Jesus, if I have to watch one more minute of this beta bitch calamity, I'm going to fucking dissipate on an atomic level. What is he doing? I saw him reread the speech. Yeah, I don't know, he does this public speaking shit every day. Maybe this is just how he warms a crowd up. Let's give him a... Hmm. Dave, are you okay? Oh, I'm fine. For a moment, something felt... Off? Again? What, is the assassin going to come take him out after all? No, it's not that. It's wonderful to see such a jammy cornucopia of supporters. By golly, a lot of you are enthusiastic about that car cat chap. Which means that we have potentially a few things in common here since I've come to... 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 I've come to... Jake tongues at his collar. It feels tight suddenly. He's dripping buckets down his suspenders. Dark patches are starting to form on his dress shirt. Rather, that is to say, in delicate times such as these, even though it's usually a toffer of a bad idea to talk about politics in public, Today we have almost certainly gathered here to to have what is definitely a political conversation. Y yes, that d does seem to be the lay of the land, but I've come here to tell you about my political opinions, which I will get to um shortly and with minimal verbal bric a bra because I... I... He's trembling so hard that he begins to worry the crowd can hear it, like the sound of somebody shaking a soda can filled with coins. He goes pale at the depravity of what he's about to do, hits him like an 18-wheeler. I've made a terrible mistake. Hey, Jake, don't undersell yourself here. You've made several terrible mistakes, especially as of late. One might even say you've made a shit ton of them, and that's just this fucking week. Or, if you'd prefer, a rusted jalopy shoved to the whirly gigs with gum fetulence, or whatever inept combination of archaic word garbage will help underline the sheer level of personal failure you've managed to achieve. Why don't you have a good long think about that, Jake? Is this really the good time for a good long think? Jake muses to himself, actually putting a finger to his chin like some public domain clip art picture of a befuddled guy. If the crowd is confused by his rapid cycle mood changes, they don't show it. Jake's got his bit of a day drinking problem, which has been slavishly documented in the global tabloids. That's how you avoid responsibility, isn't it, Jake? You can fool your fans, but not yourself. The truth is that there's a can canniness to the act. It's partially cultivated. You're stupid, but not nearly as stupid as you pretend to be. What in the devil was I thinking coming here? Why did I... I came here to... Slide the biggest knife any motherfucker ever wielded directly into your friend Jane Crocker's back. She loves you, Jake, more than anything, and you toyed with her heart. 
and you would have guiltless, guiltlessly toiled with her kettle drums, too, had it not been for a bit of divine intervention, let's decide to call it. But wait, you're thinking. Wasn't Jane merely executing a cold-blooded maneuver to rein you into the stable of her campaign using her body? How are you the bad guy here? That's true, she was trying to do that. But come on, she is ever so much less experienced than you in these matters, Jake. And without certain invisible guard tails in place to prevent it, she would have thrown herself at you again and again with wide-eyed girlish wonder. Or at least, that's what you'd like to believe. That people can't resist you. That you have no responsibility for their feelings. That everyone uses you. That you're the victim. Yes, it's so unfair that anyone in this universe, or the last, has ever had a single expectation of Jake English. Why should anyone respect your personal autonomy when you're practically begging to be taken advantage of? So tell me, Jake, which of one of us is really the bad guy here? Jake begins to tear up. He wipes his eyes with what he thinks is a subtle and manful faint, but everyone in the crowd sees what's up. He's trembling, feeling small and naked and raw, like new flesh after a scab that's been pulled away. He's scared. He's been scared. He's been running from this feeling his entire life, all because he was so pants-shittingly terrified of being in love with Dirk Strider. And why wouldn't he be afraid? He knows what'll happen to him when he finally admits it. He knows deep down that truly love Dirk would be to submit to him. It's a ter scary thought. It takes a certain degree of mental fortitude to admit that you love someone so intensely it could subsume your entire personality. But Jake can see now that it's simply how things were meant to be. There are leaders in this world, and there are followers, which is a fact that has absolutely nothing to do with the position one prefers in the bedroom. Jake can't believe how he's wasted years denying something so elemental to his nature that it might as well be on the periodic fucking table. He braces his ha shaking hands on the podium and tries to catch his breath. His mouth is filling with saliva, much like it does when he's about to throw up, or when he's desperately, devastatingly aroused. Jake, are you aroused in public, thinking about your ex? And in such tight shorts. Sorry, I'm overdoing it. That should be enough. Dude's about to pop off. The words erupt from his mouth like a tragic, Dirk-thirsty Vesuvius. I love Dirk! I am in love with Dirk! And to love Dirk is to obey him. What would Dirk want to do him to do in this situation? Definitely not sell out his good and dear friend Jane for a loudmouth pipsqueak who noisily transcends failure even as he redefines it. Do good by her, Jake. Do good by me. Oh, Jesus fucking Christ. Boy, howdy. Um, sorry about the hiccup there, folks. Hiccup? Shaking my fucking head. I've been dealing with some personal issues as of late and was momentarily distracted. But never mind that. I know what you've all come here today to hear. There's been quite a ruckus in the press the last few weeks concerning the subject of the election and, more importantly, where I stand on the candidates. So I'd like to set the record straight on that matter, as well as all other matters. You see... <gasps> oh no. Is he about to do what I think he is? What? What the fuck is happening? Carcan whips around his head as sees Dave bolt toward the stage, his palm outstretched to stop Jake from whatever he thinks he's doing. He's fast, but not fast enough. Jake opens his big dumb mouth to make the only important contribution to the plot he has or ever will make it his whole sad, pointless joke of a life. I... Having said that, it's not like we're going to sit around and listen to any more words come out of his mouth than we strictly need to. Christ almighty, what are we, masochists? Nah, that's enough of that. Let's see what John's up to. 35. Uh, like 2 in the morning now? Shit. Shit. You zap back to Earth Sea with the last of your energy, and I do mean last. You place your first foot on the ground, stumble forward three steps, and cough up blood. Trizzy has to catch you under your arms, but you're already going translucent around the edges. Your skin is cooling to the touch. The poison's coursing through your blood so furiously it's making your veins feel like cords. Trezzy can tell that you're dying. She's not in great shape herself, but she manages to tug you to your feet. John, come on. Let's get you to Jane. You try to remember if you've ever been revived by Jane before. You honestly can't recall. So much shit has happened. Maybe? It doesn't matter. This isn't a wound you can recover from. It's game over this time. No healing, no afterlife, no cosmic clock proclaiming your sacrifice is heroic. The poisoning needling through you is antithetical to narrative relevance. You're not dying, John. You're being erased. Cherubs don't fuck around. 
We've both been learning that the hard way. I guess it's tragic, though maybe not in the conventional sense. My view is, the real tragedy with you, John, is you never mattered all that much. To those on the level of the cherubs, and now my level as well, you were never all that special, despite the critical role you played. You were just a middling glob of human glue used to seal one glaring gap left in canon, a simple tool to be wielded by a mechanic whose consciousness has risen high enough to see the machine for what it was. Your complete rack lack of remarkability, specific motivation, drive, opinion, on where to direct your own fate, these deficiencies are exactly what made you so useful, so susceptible to being endowed with the unis I've borrowed to satisfy my purposes. You slip from Terezi's grip and faceplant into the grass. You hitch an elbow beneath yourself so you can roll all over onto your back. You want to see the sky. What was it that you thought when you sit, went home, John, back to your real home? That the sky here is too bright? That it looks like someone nudged the contrast a couple degrees in the wrong direction? How does it look now? You close your eyes against the light. I don't think it matters. I don't think this is a wound Jane can fix. Don't be ridiculous. Terezi, for once in my life, I'm being serious, okay? As soon as I got bit, I was dead. No, even before that, I was dead the moment I woke up that morning. Well, that's a little melodramatic. Not quite, John. You died at the moment you made the decision to go meet your destiny. You would have lived if you made the other decision, under a certain definition of the word living. You might have li even lived to see your end of your immortal lifespan, as shitty as that sounds. The objective reality of that life might be in dispute by some of the more pedantic canonistas out there, the outspoken sophists when it comes to what counts and what doesn't. They know who they are. But whatever kind of life in a bubble you'd be living, at least you'd still be breathing in it. That was the actual choice Calliope was giving you that day. That's why she looked so shad when she decided to fight Lord English, even though you knew both of them then and now that it was the only choice you possibly could have made. It was, John. This will be the best outcome for everyone, I promise. John! Hey, come here. Terezi kneels at your side. She doesn't do anything sappy like take your hand, though. Mostly because she knows how this is going to go, and doesn't want experience to to experience the tactile sensation of feeling your pulse slow under her palm. I've got, a uh, dying words to say and stuff. Really? Dying words? Oh my god, Egbert, you really are the lamest person who has ever lived. This isn't a movie, you complete dumbass. You're dying and you won't even let me help you. Trezzy, are you crying? She wipes her eyes and nods. I can't believe it. I resent the implication that I would pretend to be unaffected by your death after we had emotionally significant sexual encounter in the back of the four-wheel device once belonging to your dead human, Lucis. Heh. <laughs> I guess even after all that, I'm still a little intimidated by you, huh? Still? Yeah, I mean, you have black feelings for me, but I, I just can't feel stuff like that. I'm just a human after all. John, I... It's okay. I'm glad that I got to be with you, even if it was just for a little while. Do you mind if I say something's stupid? Potentially even multiple stupid things. Would you still say them even if I said no? P probably Then I'll be your death side confessor. Say all the stupid things, John. I'll remember them for you. Well, that actually sounded kind of romantic. She doesn't confirm or deny the intent of her statement. She cries quietly and waits for you to say whatever dumb shit's rattling around in your poison-addled mind. There's a chilly breeze rolling in from the mountains. It rustles through the trees, breaking the perfect silence of an autumn afternoon. You try to touch her face, but you can barely see now. You miss and lovingly caress the air instead. Your hands lay on back on your chest. You feel blood soaking through your shirt. You're bleeding again. Oh, man. Now that I'm on the spot, I can't think of anything significant to say. I always hoped that I was, if I was in this position, I'd have something really awesome and memorable to say, like Nick Cage would, if he died. Don't worry, I'll tell everyone you said something really cool. Would you really do that for me? If you want me to. I don't, I don't think anyone will believe you. No, they will. I promise I'll watch every shitty movie you like and find just the right stupid fucking quote. Something that nobody would ever doubt John Egbert would use as his final words. They'll believe it, trust me. 
I'll make them believe it. <laughs> Trezzy, you know, I think I really... Don't you dare. I really lo Don't you dare fucking die on me in the middle of a love confession. I forbid it. But I... I... Then John dies in the middle of a love confession. Trezzy leans closer, then holds perfectly still. She tilts her ear towards him and sniffs once. There, she can hear it. The slow seeping of blood like a distant stream. The scent of his life leaving his body, strangely unmistakable, like the quality of the air before it rains. She listens to him bleed while she smells him die. That's a fucking callback. Terezi presses her ear to his chest and confirms that his heart stopped. Her tears dry up at that. She's so devastated she can't even fucking cry. What is she supposed to do now when John was the one who asked her to come back to this place? Would she ever have any intention of returning if it wasn't for him? She doesn't know anymore. She remembers this voice, so earnest and friable. Asking her over and over again to come. In multiple realities, all he's ever want all he wanted for her was this, to be home safe with all their friends. And now that she's here, she's lost. Legs shaking. She gets to her feet and takes a whiff of the horizon. Where the fuck am I? She thinks. How do, just, how do I get on living here after everything that's just happened? That's definitely a fair question, but I have one that's much more important for her to answer. Trezzy, are you seriously just going to leave the body here? Her? Of course not. Trezzy's a practical girl, after all. She digs the wallet out of her bloodstained pants and captures the corpse. She holds it close to her heart like a secret. Like John's stupid last words, a confessor whispered for her and no one else. And then she starts walking home. Oh, wait. Actually, uh, this is the part where I stop, so, you know, um, just, like, don't look at that. Catch you next time. Got him. Oh, this was not actually too long. Comparatively. Thanks for watching.